right now, what we're seeing is a very strong job market. The Fed has to drive up the unemployment rate sufficiently to slow down the economy, to generate slack in the labor market. What we're likely to see is slower and slower and slower non-farm payrolls. It's important not to get distracted by what's happening with the layoffs in the tech sector. It's industry by industry. And that is why this is such a difficult labor market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is Payrolls Friday, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Rambert. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures basically unchanged this morning. 202K TK is your number. That's the number today, and it's going to be really interesting. I think there's a mystery to this. I think it's a mystery report. We really don't know first of the year, end of December. Look, as Mike McKee says, lots of labor noise statistically. To me, it's a big toss-up here at 8.30. You know, eight consecutive months, payrolls have surprised to the upside on the day. Yeah. It's been beat, beat, beat well, all the way back to last spring. I've been getting my coverage on radio with Paul Sweeney, 9 a.m. Yesterday, James Glassman on, without question, the most accurate labor calls last year. He said this, this gloom about it is just wrong. And he said, yeah, the tech story is tangible, but that's not the American labor economy. Well, that's the point. I think there's two questions here. Who do you <clears> listen to? Lisa, what do you look at? Because the labour market data this week has been great, and then it's been tech firm after tech firm announcing what we've gotten used to over the last 12 months, which is job cuts. That's what I keep going back to. You can pick your narrative depending on the data that you want to choose, and this is the question that a lot of people have. Why are people not listening to the labour market data more, especially when Fed officials are saying that's what matters to them, and they want to get more restrictive? The, the chart that I'm watching today is Fed funds rates, and where the market is pricing in the terminal rate. It has gotten to 5%. It had been around 4.8%, but it's nowhere near where all the Fed officials are saying, we're going to get to. Are we going full Bullard or full Kashkari? Which one is it? <laughs> I think that a lot of people are shrugging off Kashkari, but there's not that much difference <laughs> between Bullard and Kashkari. Bullard is talking oh, about a terminal rate on. of 5.1. Kashkari is talking about 5.4 with more histrionics. Wait, 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 I mean, is there a issue. difference? Really, my Please. good friend James Bullard, my good friend James Bullard said one thing yesterday, and X hours later he said a different thing. He, you know, they, they go with the wind. Kashkari, at least, has consistently been dovish. Wait, what? Yeah, I think he's been dovish. He's out at 5.4. Others are, that's, you know, that's dovish. He's leading right now. Compared to others, yeah. I think others are, you know, they're out high fives. People are warbling about seven as, you know, Bullard moved the market on 7% a couple weeks ago. Mm, okay. I'm going to turn to the I markets. Just, I just, that's the first time I've heard Kashkari called a dove, but we can talk well, about that later. At least in the past year. <laughs> yes, in the last year. <laughs> yes, because before I mean, he was he's Uber talking dove. talking about the Kashkari of two years ago. Then definitely a dove. <laughs> okay. Futures on the S&P look like this. Unchanged on the S&P 500. Going into payrolls. We are going absolutely nowhere. On the week so far, the S&P 500 heading for a fifth straight weekly loss. Longest weekly losing streak potentially going all the way back to May. In the FX market, euro dollar 105.10. Tom, we can talk about CPI out of the eurozone, if you like. Headlines CPI comes in, but it's looking like core CPI <clears throat> is pretty sticky, and sticky is a problem for the CCB. Yeah, sticky is maybe the story for 2023, the idea of the when of it all. I mean, everybody can pick their direction, and we can listen to every single guest and pundit we have on, but it's the when of it. And is there anybody really looking with confidence, John, past March 31st? I don't think so. With confidence? Yeah, no, Absolutely no, it's, not. It's just no way. No way. The 10 year right now, year or tire by <clears throat> basis point. Lisa, 37309. I don't even have confidence going into two and a half hours from now when we get that December payrolls report. What a lot of people are going to be looking for isn't necessarily the headline number expected to come in north of 200,000. But the average hourly wages, how much do they decelerate? How much do they come down, especially after that ADP report yesterday? All right, put aside how much people discount this. It showed wages much growing much more quickly than some of the other official uh, statistics have shown. Does that correlate will be really interesting. 10 a.m., we talk about core, uh, core inflation in the Eurozone, core inflation in the U.S., the fact that some indicators are going down the good side. But services is really the question. We get ISM services index for December. We also get factory goods and durable uh, factory orders and durable goods. I'm more interested in services, how much resilient there is, there, is there is there, considering the fact that that really is one of the drivers of inflation at this point. And we get a roster of Fed speak today. We can parse the doves from the hawks. The, I, again, the delta between them, not that great, which I think is indicative of just where this Fed is and how united it is in terms of at least the rhetoric that we're hearing. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, Fed Governor Lisa Cook, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, and Kansas City Fed President Esther Jordan. 
you running out of breath there, <laughs> going through those names. I mean, honestly, Is that enough for you? you know, we also have other people coming in. We've got ECB uh, chief economist. We have, uh, you know, former uh, Fed head Ben Bernanke. I mean, everyone's speaking today, basically. Great, fantastic. You excited about that, Tom? I'm just uh, getting warm Cannot and wait. fuzzy. Lisa, thank you. <clears throat> Steve Whiting joins us now, chief investment strategist and chief economist at City Global Wealth Management. Steve, happy New Year to you. Fantastic Morning, to catch up with you, sir. The labour market data so far this week. Let's go through it together. Job openings still indicating a strong market. You look at the quits rate still indicating a strong labour market. Jobless claims strong. You look elsewhere, the ADP for whatever that's worth strong. <clears throat> Steve, what is it right now? Do we have a tight labour market or one that's about to crack? We have a tight labour market, but let's recall that recessions begin when labor markets have reached their peak, when they've reached the greatest level of progress, right? So it really matters, again, where things will be. What are the dynamics that will add the labor demand going forward? No, just think the easy one is the housing market. If you don't have home sales, you're probably not going to need people to build more homes. And if you just think about broad construction employment, all of our full year declines that we've had in them, uh, since going back to World War II, have also been declines in broad private employment. What is the need for labor when we have massive increases in inventories? Now, we're not going to worry too much about American manufacturing and that, but marketing, sales, advertising positions, these are things that tell us where labor market demand will be in the next 12 months. Uh, and I think it's going to be significantly worse than the year behind us, but we're still trying to catch up with demand. Steve Whiting, I just looked at Mancuse, Principles of Economics, and you are expert at Chapter 25, which is actually linking the real economy into your strategy and into Citigroup economics. What do profits look like, and what does that mean for the Fed? Greenspan would say it's a big deal. I'm not hearing this conversation in 2023. Is it a big deal? Right. I think it's a big deal for markets, absolutely. And, you know, you want to think about national income. You might want to think about profits as well as wages. You know, there's a, a gain for one. There's a loss for the other. And we think that the uh, drop that we will have in profits this year will be low double digits. I think we got some of the action out of the way uh, last year with what happened with uh, financials and some of the consumer areas. Uh, but it's going to be a disincentive to invest and add capacity to the economy to rebalance in a stronger way. We'll rebalance in a weaker way, unfortunately, in the economy to get inflation down. Steve, one uh, consensus that I've heard start to form around the edges is a less uh, a less offensive kind of view of tech right now. People are talking about tech as possibly having some gains this year because of the cuts that we've heard, the job cuts, the cost cutting. <laughs> Do you agree that that will actually dampen some of the pessimism and create some upside for tech this year? Not immediately. Now, in the end, have we had a really severe drop in demand for some of these companies in terms of tech? I mean, there are cyclical components. It's a lot of advertising. Um, there's some that move merchandise around. These are all not very much the same type of tech companies that were all clustered in the late 1990s. Um, what we have had is a big adjustment down in valuation driven by interest rates. The economic impact of a slump probably isn't fully there yet, even in the tech sector and some of the cyclical areas. But I think, again, we'll get out of it. And uh, you can see, again, the tech industries that had a lot of COVID benefits, the adaptations we needed uh, to use tech to make the economy work during COVID, some of that was excess. And I don't view, uh, again, just getting cheap enough because of low rates as really the catalyst for recovery. Um, it will come probably before the year is out, though. Let's just remember how much changes from beginning of the year to the end of the year, how different our years were just in the last few years. So I, I think, again, we will probably see that recovery within 2023, but not soon. What's the leadership then for this year? Well, I think immediate leadership uh, is just defensive, highest quality companies in their industry um, that uh, you know have a lot more profits than they pay out in dividends, so they raise their <laughs> dividends. It's pharmaceuticals. It's some of the non-cyclical industries that have been beaten down. Um, and there are some little anomalies. I mean, China had its hard landing in 2022. You know, we seem to be following that same quarter, sort of a policy tightening course that can get us a better 2024. Um, they're a little ahead of the game on that. And then they have the unusual factors. But it, really, it will be a recovery. I think that the Fed is imposing a severe slowing on the economy. 
and then the recovery from that will be stronger. So there will be cyclical leadership again, uh, but we still haven't felt all of this in the economy yet. Uh, all of these orders numbers, ISM orders readings at 45 is telling us that the goods sector is going to have a big drop and it's not going to leave all of the services sector employment unscathed. Steve Waddick of City Global Wealth Management. Steve, thank you. Just picking up on the ISM data a little bit earlier this week on the manufacturing side. Not great at all. Echoing some of this, B of A, B of A this morning. We think the next big story for markets will be a sharp loss of growth momentum in response to aggressive monetary tightening. They are not constructive on European equities. A prosperous new year, TK. They put a big yeah. question mark on that. This is important. What Steve Whiting just said there dovetails perfectly with his colleague Stuart Kaiser on what Citigroup sees is what's called the, the jargon is a diminished choice set. You're sitting at your desk and you got to figure out what to do and there's fewer and fewer ideas, John, because of the new constraints. And of course, one of those constraints is money finally costs something. But I loved what Stuart Kaiser said to us 10 days ago, two weeks ago. I love what Whiting says here, that it's just really, there's fewer things to pick right now. You know, the new consensus on that though, <clears throat> it's by bonds. If there is something we can agree on, well, they it, are lining up to start 23 cents. Lisa, the conversation yesterday from Deborah Cunningham I thought was brilliant with Federer Hermes. I'm not saying I agree with her, but she said, look, you're going to clip the coupon this year if you're lucky. Well, and, that's, and that's an outlier call. Well, but there are a growing number of people, and I keep going back to what Rubila Faruqi said, this collision course between the Fed and where market expectations are right now. And they're kind of going to be doing an <clears throat> uncomfortable dance that will create volatility throughout the year. And that's going to create uh, perhaps a premium for a, a coupon that can give you income to offset that but not much more. Looking forward to Priya Misra's view on this. She's going to join us yes. a little bit later this yes. morning yes. from TD. Fantastic lineup for you on this sure. Payrolls Friday. Priya Misra of TD okay. coming up a little bit later. Sure. Then we'll catch up with Tom Porcelli of RBC. Following that, Randy Krosner, formerly of the Federal Reserve, and Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock after the jobs number a little bit later. Looking at your equity market, we shape up as follows on the S&P 500. Equity futures going absolutely nowhere going into this job sprint in a couple of hours' time. We're positive by what? A little more than a tenth of 1%. Yields up almost a single basis point on a 10-year, 372.53. Euro dollar not doing much at 105.06. And what a choppy week it's been for crude. Just about holding on to 74 here. $74 a barrel and positive a half of 1%. On this Payrolls Friday, your rest of the this morning is 202,000. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Today's U.S. jobs report will help determine what the Federal Reserve does next on interest rates. The estimates are that employers added fewer jobs last month. Now, this indicates a cooling in the labor market that would reduce the need for higher rate hikes. But data released Thursday show the job market is still resilient. Inflation in the Eurozone has returned to single digits for the first time since August. And that's fueling hopes that the bloc's worst ever spike in consumer prices has peaked. Prices in December were up 9.2 percent from a year ago. Slower growth in energy costs was a big reason. Republicans making history on Capitol Hill. Party dissidents have blocked Kevin McCarthy from becoming Speaker of the House on 11 ballots. That's a post-Civil War record. The standoff has left Republicans fractured after they reclaimed the majority. McCarthy has offered concessions to hardline conservatives, but so far he hasn't been able to get enough votes. Russia is seeking more cash from commodity producers and state-owned companies to help offset the cost of the war in Ukraine. Proposals include one-time payment from fertilizer and coal companies. Russia's budget has been increasingly squeezed by higher military spending and an economy battered by international sanctions. And that holiday travel meltdown is prompting Southwest Airlines to revise its financial outlook before reporting fourth quarter results. The airline canceled almost 16,000 flights over eight days. Southwest says it is assessing the cost of flight disruptions and compensation to passengers for hotels and meals. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Republicans to get their act together. And we as Democrats are ready, willing, and able to partner with them to find common ground 
whenever and wherever possible. Not as Democrats, not as Republicans, as Americans. It's time for Congress to get to work. That was Representative Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, live from New York City on this Payrolls Friday. Counting it down to payrolls about two hours and 13 minutes away. Your market action looks like this on the S&P 500. Futures positive by just a tenth of 1%. Trying to erase some of the losses of the week so far. Heading for a fifth straight consecutive loss on the S&P 500. On a weekly basis in the bond market, yields have been lower through the week so far. Yields trying to push higher by almost the basis point right now on a 10-year at 372.35. We've had some data from Europe this morning. I'll touch on that briefly. Euro Please. dollar at 105.07. We've got a problem with core CPI over in Europe. Clearly headline inflation is slowing sharply, but core CPI year over year in the Eurozone is still 5.2%. That was actually higher, Tom, than the previous month. It went up. I didn't know that. Interesting. On a year-over-year year basis, well, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see January 12th to get a parallel on that. John, I think it's important to say that the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index into this jobs report is ever more accommodative. It is buttressed up against recent maximum accommodation. I think that's a big issue for this Federal Reserve, Tom. <clears throat> yeah. And we've asked the question, are we seeing an unwarranted easing of financial conditions, yeah. given their objective to get inflation lower and on a path? where they're convinced that we can get back to 2%. One of the great things we do here at Surveillance is we listen worldwide to experts on a given theme, and it was very good the other day to listen to a professor from Oxbridge in England, Professor Jonathan Farrow, who lectured us on American civics. John, you absolutely nailed, nailed what William Cohen, the extinguished William Cohen, Senator of Maine, Secretary of Defense, along with Alton Fryer, Fry of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. The Democrats could, however, offer motions to open the possibility of selecting a speaker capable of working across the aisle, nominating an experienced, respected Republican from outside the House could trigger a contested ballot leading to a speaker in the mold of the original constitutional conception. John, you nailed this. I didn't say it on air, though, Tom, so I'm not sure it counts, but I'm pleased you've brought no, up private okay. conversations. No, that's everything we say, even <laughs> off-air counts. You know. Oh, boy. Seriously? There we are. Let's go to Amory Horton on this. Can we keep some of the off-air stuff off-air? <laughs> Amory, I lost, Amory, I lost count. How many votes are we up to? This morning, what is the, this afternoon, rather, is it the 10th or the 11th vote? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure this morning will be his 12th, this afternoon. 12th vote. At noon, yes. Okay. I want to talk about this reality. I talked to a bunch of Washington insiders yesterday, and they're waiting for common sense to come in here. And there's an out where somebody from outside can come in if McCarthy, I guess, agrees, or you tell me the uh, process. They mentioned the governor of Maryland, Hogan, and they mentioned the gentleman from Michigan, Upton. Is there even a possibility mm -hmm. Upton or Hogan would save the day? Yeah, Fred Upton's name has been circling, especially in the Twitter world. But this is really just interesting thinking that this is a West Wing episode. It will not happen. At that point, if McCarthy is unable to get the votes he needs, the Republican will just try for another candidate. They are not going to strike a deal with the Democrats. That is a Hail Mary. And honestly, it's just dream world. It would not right. happen. What's McCarthy's dream world this morning? I asked you this question less today. Let's redux it. Who does he call this morning? It's the same. Well, Punchbowl News is reporting that the Republicans are going to have a virtual conference this morning where McC McCarthy and his leadership team will go through the new rules. Now, this is the same concessions that we already spoke about the entire week, the biggest one being that one individual can have this motion to vacate, the fact that maybe more Freedom Caucus uh, members could be on the very important rules committee, and he would outline this. And, you know, I spoke to an aide of one of these dissenters who said the devil's in the details and when those details become public. So if McCarthy is able to, and, and what we're hearing, especially the Washington Post is reporting that there are some of these individuals are starting to move to support him, if he goes through this vote and he starts to ease some of these numbers, right, and you have some of those 20 move over to him and he shows some progress, they're calling that phase one, according to the Washington Post. And then they would move into phase two, which would be immense pressure from conservative Republicans and moderate Republicans to get the remainder on board for him to hit 218. But we should make very clear, if he is able to clinch this, and it could go into the weekend, he will start his speakership very, very weak because well, he's given away so many concessions. That's where I wanted to go. The phase one, phase two car wash. Does it leave any moderate Republicans not wanting to support Kevin McCarthy and want to nominate somebody else because of how much he's given up? 
Well, the, the issue is, even if they go to someone in his leadership team, like Steve Scalise, whose name has been mentioned a number of times, they've already all worked on this deal. Patrick Mc McHenry, Representative Emmer, they worked on this deal. So the Freedom Caucus members know what they can get out of it. So really, I think it is going to be a weak leader, regardless of who it is, unless they go for this dream world land that Tom is talking about, which is you get a Democrats on board and you get an outside um, unity candidate. Does this make the Republican Party more extreme or more moderate, considering that the moderates may have to work more closely with the Democrats to get anything done? It's a great question. Libby Cantrell of PIMCO spoke to us about this yesterday when it comes to the debt ceiling. Everyone is talking about the fact that this just foreshadows how difficult those negotiations are going to be when it comes to raising the debt ceiling and everyone is concerned about being on that cliff the way we were, say, in 2011. She's actually saying that a lot of these moderate Republicans come from Biden won districts. And what they are going to want to prove more than ever after this absolute chaotic debacle on the House floor, being able to elect a speaker, which we have not seen in 100 years, they're going to want to show they are able to govern and that they are not paying fast and loose with the U.S. credit, with the U.S. spending. And but she says that potentially this can actually show that those negotiations will be easier. But it remains to be seen. AMH, I just want to set up the next hour with you when you come back. But just briefly, what's happening with Ukraine and Russia and this mm. so-called offer of a ceasefire from Vladimir Putin? Please don't read into this ceasefire. Vladimir Putin is being beaten on the battlefield. What we have seen in the Far East most recently, Russia admitting uh, that they lost 89 um, members of their military. That number was raised. And right now, he has suffered a number of defeats. This is a moment for Vladimir Putin to give in to this idea that because it is the Orthodox Christmas that they want to cease fire, this is his moment to potentially restock and look at goods. And for the Ukrainians, if there are Russian military on their soil and they do not have territorial sovereignty, there is no ceasefire. We'll continue this conversation in about 60 minutes. Looking forward to it. AMH down in D.C. Anne Marie, thank you. On this Payrolls Friday, if you're just tuning in on TV and radio, your estimate this morning is 202,000. The range is pretty big looking ahead to the number we get in about two hours' time, but 202K is the number we're looking for. The unemployment rate expected to stick at 3.7%, and the overwhelming focus, I think, on Wall Street at the moment, at least it's going to be on wages. 5% is the estimate, 5.1% was the previous number. And that, I think, is where people's eyes are. Although, that said, the headline number will be interesting, with Bill Dudley saying that it has to fall below 100,000 for several consecutive monthly reads in order to get to perhaps where the Fed wants to go. Wages will be some leading indicator of just how tight the labor market is and whether we're anywhere closer to that. It's okay. Yeah, I, I would go with that. I think it's a massive mystery. You know, as you mentioned at the top of the show, John, 200 up to 202. Uh, the wage dynamics will be great. But I, I just think it's a more nuanced thing than punditry certitude right now. Is Steve Whiting would say, what about profits versus wages? That's an important dynamic. And I would also point out off the trade balance the other day, exports minus imports is compared to something we talked about 15, 20 years ago, domestic final sales, which is sort of the American interior economy. All this jumble staggers us out not to today, but gets us out to January 12th. Do you think the pundits really have certainty right now? I don't think anyone has They're certainty. They're paid to have certainty. Confidence That's our, on anything. We believe. Okay, they might say we believe, and then they say asterisk. We don't know what we're talking about because no one knows what's going to happen. No, I mean, I, honestly, that's what it's been like. Brutal. I couldn't do it. One of my favorite conversations <clears throat> at the end of last year was with Sarah House of Wells Fargo on what she called the final mile, getting yeah. inflation down yes. to, towards 2% after the big moves we saw last year. That conversation coming up next. Two hours away from the payrolls report. Equity futures up by a tenth of 1%. Good morning to you. We look like this across the board on the NASDAQ. We're just slightly negative here. We're down about a tenth of 1%. Down on the week here on the S&P 500 by almost one full percentage point. Down for a fifth consecutive week in the bond market. I have to say this bond market has not traded on the labour market data, which has been resilient this week because yields through Thursday That's on hard. a 10-year down about 15 basis points. Now, maybe you can blame the ISM. It came in soft. <coughs> Perhaps you can say something about the Fed speak whipsawed between 
Hawks and Doves. I've got no idea, Bramo, but people are lining up to buy bonds. Your 10 year, 372, 72. And that's on the long end. And here's really what my question is. If you take a look at the very short end, you have seen yields rising and you see that yield curve inversion for the three month and the 10 month reaching the lowest since at least 1992. So maybe that's where they're uh, sort of talking about it. But I get your point. Collision course right now. People aren't buying with the Fed selling. Two's tens, negative 74 yeah. this morning. We'll build that's on underplay. That with Priya the, Misra. The new steepness and this, the new greater inversion when, is underplay. Do you remember when Priya underplay. came on a number of months ago and she said negative 40 and we were like, wow, massive call. Yeah. yeah. Negative 40, negative yeah. 50. And yeah. here we are just sort of relaxed and comfortable with this <clears> idea that we're at negative 74 on two's tens. I'll get to that in a moment. I want to finish on this in the foreign exchange market. Just euro dollar. Had a bit of CPI data out of the eurozone today. Headline CPI slowing sharply year over year, we're told. But if you look at core, Sticky, elevated, still problematic for the ECB. Lisa mentioned earlier, about 30 minutes ago, you'll hear from Philip Lane, the chief economist of the ECB, a little bit later this morning. So look out for comments on that. Euro dollar just about holding on to 105 at the moment. 105.08, negative a tenth of 1%. As I say, we're about two hours away from the December payrolls report. Jobs growth expected to slow to 202,000. Unemployment set to hold steady at 3.7%. Russ Kostrick of BlackRock, weighing in. It's industry by industry. And that is why this is such a difficult labor market. We're seeing softening in parts of the professional uh, class. But if you look at other parts of the labor market, hospitality, restaurants, healthcare, these segments of the economy lost hundreds of thousands of workers during the pandemic that have never come back. They're still missing workers, which is why the quit rate is still high. And it's why the labor market may remain somewhat resilient as Russ Kostrick, Tom, still a pandemic labour market yeah, with a ton I, of new ones. Well, this is the you and I mentioned this yesterday. This is still the thing. Where are we in the pandemic right now? We're clearly in it. We're still, you know, I believe it's under 400 killed a day. But the answer is the pandemic is statistically still valid. And yes, it's part of this economic story. You've got these large companies that were able to hire. Amazon, Meta, yeah. through the pandemic, <clears> laying people off. Then these small and medium-sized companies that are still looking to hire. And that's reflected by the elevated job openings we're seeing across the country, Tom. Difficult to read. I think Lisa said it a few times this week, and I'm totally on board with her. If you've got a narrative, an argument, easy to make it right now because there's plenty of data to back up whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go with that. Let's talk to somebody. You mentioned this earlier, John, somebody way out front in this a number of months ago. A great insight on the last mile, the last moment here of the American economy. Sarah House joins senior economist at Wells Fargo. I love what you're saying, you know, Sarah, your update into the new year that we are hardly falling apart. I believe I read that in Economics 302 uh, years ago. What does hardly falling apart mean? Well, it means that we are seeing, I think, the jobs market softening to some degree. We see it in things like demand coming down, layoffs at least no longer improving if you're looking at the claims data. But I think when you step back and you look at where things are on an absolute basis, so just the overall level of demand, just how low we're still seeing layoff levels, this is still a very strong jobs market. And we can see that in a wide range of data, everything from the still very low unemployment rate to also still very strong job uh, and still very strong yeah. wage growth. Let's go to payroll 101. John mentioned 202 is a number. I don't know what the three-month moving average is with revision today. What is the run rate of a normal job growth for the non-farm payroll statistic? We used to be shocked when we said it was 150. Others have gone below that. Where's the Wells Fargo statistic of what the normal monthly growth rate is if we're not booming like we are now? Well, it depends on what's happening in terms of that labor supply growth, so both participation and, and population trends, which are by no means favorable. And when you step back and you factor those in, so the Atlanta Fed right now estimates you only need about 85,000 jobs wow. per month just to keep the unemployment rate at 3.7 percent, let alone, you know, if you if you see that needing to go a little bit higher in order to stomp out some of these, <clears throat> these wage pressures that are contributing to inflation. Lisa? I've never heard that statistic before. Under 100, I've heard, but not 85,000 is a stunning statistic of where we are. It takes a lot more work. It takes a lot more work in terms of decre uh, decrease in the demand picture in order to get employment where the Fed wants it to be, perversely higher unemployment as they <clears throat> seek to combat inflation. Sarah, how long do you expect it would take at its shortest to get to a level that is more comfortable for the Fed, that perhaps there is a little bit of a dampening pressure on inflation coming from the labor market? How long does it take, given the strength that we're seeing today? 
So I think we'll see more market slowdown as we move through this year. So we are seeing firms curtailing those hiring plans. So if you look at the NFIB, for example, those hiring plans are, are the lowest we've seen since early 2021, only you know, roughly on par with what we saw in 2019. So I think we're moving that, that direction. So some of the recent job growth has, has still been catch up in, in areas like leisure and hospitality, government sector payrolls, for, for example. But I think as we move further into this year, as the environment gets increasingly challenging with the high rate environment, with the, the clouds hanging over the broader growth outlook, you're going to see businesses get more cautious, particularly when that cost of labor is still pretty high. So I think that is going to put a dampener on, on the pace of payroll growth, you know, and we're going to feel it more you know, probably around the spring, mid-year. Even as people talk about recession and say the United Kingdom, we're seeing a series of strikes uh, throughout the industries, in particular the railroads. In the U.S., on the peripheries, there have been a number of labor activity, organized labor movements. How much has that pendulum stayed in favor of the employee for the first time after so many years of the employer kind of having the upper hand? Yeah, so employ employees are still in a, a relatively good position compared to what we've seen over the prior decades. I think some of that sway has weakened a little bit here in, in the recent months. And so we have, I, I've heard from a lot of the clients that I've talked to, you know, they are seeing it a little bit easier to hire, a little bit easier to find quality workers. So they're not quite as worried about losing <laughs> some existing workers. And so I think we're starting to see that come down on the margin. But right. again, stepping back and looking at where we are in, in in absolute sense, right. employees right now still have a, a lot of a lot of sway. Sir, a, a sort of a philosophical question. One of the great things of the pandemic was the invention of $17 per hour, because all sorts of ginormous box warehouses need to put bodies in them. Is there a permanence to what Amazon and others did with these ginormous warehouses where they paid up? and destroy the labor economy of the regions around them. Is that going to continue or was that a one-off that drifts away? Well, I think in terms of the long-term trend towards towards e-commerce, I think that's in place even as we are seeing a little bit of a setback as you get the composition of consumer spending shift away from goods towards services. But I think it has left a, a more long-lasting mark on on the wage picture. So if you think about a lot of this, a lot of the other uh, industries that are having to compete against that lift in in that wage level. So everything from your retail, but also things like daycare services. So those are those are industries that have had to really pay up um, in order to compete with these industries. And we know that you know nominal wages do not decline on, on net over time. So this is, I think, a, a level shift up, and that's going to keep wage pressures on a lot of other sectors, even as you see a slowdown in, in the e-commerce and, and warehousing industry. Just quickly here, Sarah, we were arguing earlier on the show about the distance between 5.1% and 5.4% terminal rate in the Fed funds, the distance between going full Bullard versus uh, full Kashkari. How different is that? I don't think 5.1 or 5.4 is, is, is really that big a deal. I think it's more just how long that we stay a, around those levels. So I think um, there's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see time will tell uh, in terms of whether whether we get there. But I think uh, it's really more about just how long you see that, that very restrictive policy linger. Sarah, you've been excellent. Thanks for being with us this morning again. Sarah House there of Wells Fargo. I think the Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed earlier this week in that blog post called it the second step of our inflation fight. Lisa, the second step of our inflation fight is keeping rates there, just pausing and waiting. And that's where the disagreement in this market and the communication between the Federal Reserve is right now. I could not agree more, especially when Fed funds rates are showing uh, rate cuts still for next year. If they keep uh, f the Fed funds rates at 5%, for a year or two years, that is a huge difference than just getting there once for a couple months. Your tenure at the moment, 372.53. One stock to watch. You know this story so well at this point. Southwest in the pre-market looks a little something like this. The stock is lower by a little more than one full percentage point. You're well aware, I'm sure, of these statistics. Between December 22nd through December 29th, almost 51% of the total flights were cancelled. 
by Southwest, according to Flight Aware data. And this morning, they put a number on it. The estimated revenue loss from $400 million to $425 million. The company expected to report a net loss in the fourth quarter off the back of this chaos over the holiday period. Yeah, I, it's, it's amazing to see, John, and I'll be honest, I haven't flown Southwest much, but this is part of the culture and fabric of Texas and a huge part of this country. This stock, John, is basically flatlined with this decline back eight years. That's stunning. This is Southwest. This is like the profit center of the airline business, and that image has just been blown up. Is there is going to be, to Tom, a massive PR effort now over the next couple of months. And Lisa, we talked about it. Will you trust them if you need to get to a business meeting? Will you trust them over the winter period to get to wherever you need to go, a special holiday, whatever it might Ski be? Trip. And how much will they need to adjust the price to make you take that risk? Yeah, or give drink vouchers. I do think that it's interesting that Jeffries this, uh, came out with this analyst uh, expectation. Yes, you talked about a $400 million loss. They're talking about a figure north of $800 million, talking about $550 million tied to the cancellations themselves, but then an additional hundreds of millions of dollars to compensate people for the car rentals, for the hotel rooms, for all the lost travel when they were absolutely marooned during the holiday I, period. And, and, and my reading of this from the unions, and granted they've got an angle on this, is simply... They've underinvested in technology. On Wall Street, if you do that, you go out of business. Nobody's talking about Southwest going out of business. But what do they do? A whole new tech program to say we're not the old Southwest anymore? This that's, goes back. That's what five year project. To something Lisa's talked about repeatedly over the last couple of months for this industry. Raises questions about the capital return programs over the last couple of years. In if a bigger this, way. If this is a basic infrastructure of this nation and that's how it's been considered with all of these uh, Congress members standing behind them and supporting <clears> them in a crisis, then can they continue to have the same kind of dividend programs? It's going to be a big question. Stock is down about 1% in the pre-market. It is payrolls Friday. That means we'll catch up with Tom Porcelli of RBC Capital Markets. I believe he is above consensus for payrolls. And that's where you need to be over the last 12 months or so. We've had eight consecutive beats on the day on Payrolls Friday. Will we make it nine? We'll catch up with Tom in about an hour from now. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Kevin McCarthy's fight to become Speaker of the House drags into a fourth day. After his historic 11 rounds of voting, the, Republic, the California Republicans still couldn't lock in all the votes needed from GOP dissidents to hold the position. That's despite offering concessions on House rules. McCarthy and some of his supporters said they will press ahead with negotiations no matter how long it takes. U.S. authorities are ramping up the pressure on Sam Bankman-Fried's inner circle. Bloomberg's learned they are now scrutinizing one of his close associates at the bankrupt FTX crypto exchange, Nishad Singh. Now, Singh hasn't been accused of wrongdoing, and it's unclear if he will be cooperating with investigators or will do so. And it's a major shift in a Chinese policy blamed for exacerbating one of the biggest real estate meltdowns in the country's history. Beijing plans to dial back the so-called three red lines policy and relax restrictions on developer borrowing. Property firms may be allowed to add more leverage and the deadline for meeting debt targets may be pushed back. Quarterly profit at Samsung Electronics fell by the most in more than a decade. That may mean that the global economic slowdown may be hurting electronics demand even more than expected. Samsung's operating profit plunged 69 percent. South Korea's largest company has been grappling with weak demand for memory chips, smartphones and displays. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We've gone all the way back now to the pre-inflation uh, shock uh, level of inflation expectations. Uh, macro theories tell us that that bodes very well for the future of an actual inflation. So this is a good signal for uh, disinflation in 2023. That was Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed. Catch to market right then. With the people <laughs> yesterday. Look, he said exactly what Chairman Powell said in the news conference, which is we're getting closer to sufficiently restrictive. 
it was it was almost word for word precisely what the chairman had said in the news conference. And yeah. anyway, the market's going to do its thing. Equity futures unchanged this morning. And good morning to you on this payrolls Friday. The S&P 500 going nowhere. Down on the week, unchanged on the session. Yields right now up about a basis point down on the week. Up on a session, 372.53 on a 10-year. Euro dollar just a breaketh 105 right now, 104.97. We're negative a quarter of 1%. As I say, core CPI, a problem still in the Eurozone, <clears throat> even if headline CPI is fading just a little bit. So that's the story in Europe. Let's get to the story right now for Southwest. Putting a number on things for us. The stock is down by about 1% in the pre-market. It expects a net loss in 4Q, driven by... A prelim estimated pre-tax negative impact of $725 million to $825 million due to the operational disruptions through December. Putting a number on those disruptions, Tom, cancelled more than 16,700 flights between December 21 and December 31st. Unfair question. Did they get a bailout from the federal government during the pandemic? I mean, they all did, right? Well, this is what Lisa and I were talking about. Yeah, I know. I was listening. The capital return programs of some of these firms over the last three, four, five years go back even further. And then you're coming out and saying, well, we underinvested in our, in our infrastructure. And that's why they're getting a ton of pushback, Lisa. So let's put a number on that. Southwest paid out nearly $10 billion to shareholders in the five years leading up to the pandemic because they had that much cash. And they used <clears throat> so much of it to reward their shareholders. The question is, why didn't they invest it in some of the basic technology the that could have provided? Yeah. This is what the unions are saying. But there is also a question, and shareholders are saying that now, too. Full disclosure, British Air has the same problem. You know, my amateur take on what British Air is doing, they're no different. I mean, their system You know that you divorced BA. I, I do. I, I, that's why I'm just, laughing, because I know that this is like a personal issue. Yeah. Do you want to tell us who you're hooking up with instead? No, I don't think no, I, I don't fancy it, right. care. You know, I mean, I, I have the advantage of the Gulfstream, and you know, it's fine. But, you know, I, I really haven't picked a new carrier, you know. I thought you had. Well, you know, I just don't think, you know, I don't think the public really cares what you fly or I fly. They do care what Lisa flies. I mean, well, we know who <laughs> Lisa flies. <laughs> Golf stream. Well, look, she got stuck in, stuck in Atlanta. Do you okay. That? All right. All right. We don't have to get into that. Come on. Look, I do think there is this question, particularly with low cost airlines or those that are catering to families. How much pain are people willing to tolerate to continue to vacation? Yeah. And I think that well, that is really going to ultimately be the question. Will it just take some drink vouchers, mm -hmm. some free frequent I'm flyer sorry, miles? Drink drink vouchers. No, that's what everybody is saying. Literally, like the small small perks that you can give that are the lowest yeah. on the totem pole of, of expenses. You're laughing at me, but these are the things that people think about. It's yeah. ridiculous. At Bloomberg, they extended drink vouchers because Anna Wong absolutely nailed it last year. She did. On this jobs day, Anna Wong with a victory lap over the number one call in terminal rate economics last year among all of our guests with Bloomberg Economics. It was stunning, Anna, when you said above 5%. Nobody believed you then, and now you're the norm. How have you changed your dynamic? of the terminal rate in the last number of weeks? Yeah, uh, we haven't changed it. We are still at 5% terminal rate. Uh, we expect two more 25 basis point <coughs> rate hikes. And I, I think the way to think about it and how we thought about it last year really was thinking about real Fed funds rate. We think that the Fed wants real Fed funds rate to be at 1.5 or 1.6%. So then it depends on where you think inflation would be. Right. And we think that inflation would be hanging around 3.5 to, uh, to, you know, around that vicinity, um, starting around the middle of this year. Right. So that's that's how we get to get that. Okay, that's the monetary side. What does the job economy do in this? It is jobs day. Maybe we're out front of where we'll be in May or in August, but what is the job reaction function to the Anna Wong 5% call? Yeah, I mean, so, so economists right now are still pricing in a terminal rate of higher than 5%. So, so there's a difference between traders and economists right now. Traders no. think that the terminal rate is at 5%. <clears throat> Fed will cut by 40 bips by the end of 2023. Economists think it will peak at 5.25 and the Fed won't cut. So where we stand is that we, we do think the terminal rate would be at 5 just because that there, I, I think that the near-term uh, downward momentum on uh, inflation is actually pretty strong given what's happening in China and commodity prices. And, and even in the in terms of jobs, I think that the headline number today uh, from non-farm payroll 
would overstate the tightness of the labor market because um, you know last December in the middle of the December uh, uh, the early revisions uh, came out so so you know the, the the jobs report we're getting today is based on only a sample of firms it's not the definitive number and once every year BLS revised all the numbers in March where they use a census population of firms where that data is a definitive data of what's happening to the jobs market and that number we got an early preview of that number last December and it's not looking good so I, I think that um, the, the labor market is actually cooling faster than what the robust uh, non-farm payroll number mm. would suggest today. Well, is that perhaps what the market's sniffing out? Because we talked about the dissonance between the market and where economists are. And honestly, markets tend to be correct, and economists haven't had the best track record over the past decade or so, or even longer. So at what point is the market sniffing out exactly what you're talking about, perhaps a little bit more slack in the labor market than currently uh, being represented by headline numbers, a rapid disinflation? kind of pulse. How much is that going to really push the hand of the Fed later this year? Well, you, you know, for sure, the traders markets have put their money in where the mouth is. So, so, but I do think that the economists have a, a comparative advantage in, in understanding what the, the Fed's reaction function is and, and that the Fed <clears throat> is serious about not cutting. So I, I think the, the market is uh, uh, still a little bit, um, you know, um, over optimistic that the Fed will cut, but the economists are 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 right that um, you know that that the wage persistence um, underlying inflation is stronger, uh, whereas the market thinks that inflation will become a non-story by the end of this year. So, as an economist, I want to go to the question that John's been asking quite a bit of the Fed, which is, where is the balance of risks right now? Is it equally balanced between uh, hiking too fast and torpedoing the economy and fighting inflation, or is it still asymmetric towards fighting inflation despite some of the disinflation that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think that given all the things that we know today on, and the data we have in our hand, the, the risk seems to be balanced. We are seeing data that seems to, inflation data that seems to be surprised on the downside rather than upside now. However, I think the battle that the, the Fed is fighting, and they are definite, definitely learning from the mistakes they had last year, is that there are all these unforeseen uh, shocks that could come on in this uncertain world. You know, there are maybe um, labor strikes, union strikes later this year, or, you know, just unforeseen shocks that could de deride their whole inflation fight. And so from a risk management perspective, you want to come out ahead of that because inflation expectations are still a little bit fragile to, to you know, any additional shocks. And a great call last year. Just great to catch up with you. Thank you. Anna Wong there of Bloomberg Economics looking for that 5% terminal rate when <clears> it was not in fashion back in decidedly, the decidedly summer of last year. Stunning call. Actually, fantastic I mean, Priya call. Misra, it's the call, two calls of the year. Priya's coming up in a moment. Yeah. And I go back to what Priya said a number of months ago when she said twos, tens could go through 40 basis points, maybe right. threaten to go to 50. And here we are at negative 74. No one talks about it anymore. It doesn't even come up in conversations that I have. Well, part of the reason why is because even the person who really kind of founded the yield curve model has poo-pooed this question of whether it actually is predictive of recession this time around. Uh -huh. So there is a question of whether it matters. That said, the fact that we've gotten comfortable with this tells you how far we've come and perhaps how much people are perhaps overly sanguine about whatever it might be suggesting. Yeah, I don't want to jump on board about the predictive nature of the yield curve and all that good stuff. I just think when you're willing to accept a high yield in the near term and a lower one in the longer term. It says something about where we're at. You can dismiss it. You cannot dismiss it. This goes back to what we were saying. You could pick a data point, emphasize it, de-emphasize it, and then craft a narrative no, around it. <clears throat> but you're right. I totally agree with you. It says something really significant when you can earn more going into a money market fund than you can to lend to this country totally. for 10 years. If the 10-year is lower than the two-year, it says something about where investors' heads are at. I am a tradi traditionalist in that, and what's important, folks, for those not paying attention, is the vector over the last 15 days has not been discussed, which is I'm seeing negative 75 basis points right now, John. A huge body of our audience is not aware of that new further inversion. Priya Misra will have some things to say. I have to say also, TD has the biggest call on payrolls for this morning. They're looking for a punchy number. So we'll get some more on that with Priya oh, I didn't know that. in just a moment. She comes up You're next. Font of wisdom. From TD. Do you not go through the estimates, Tom? No, I don't go through the estimates. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> more to what Conti will do.
right now, what we're seeing is a very strong job market. The Fed has to drive up the unemployment rate sufficiently to slow down the economy, to generate slack in the labor market. What we're likely to see is slower and slower and slower non-farm payrolls. It's important not to get distracted by what's happening with the layoffs in the tech sector. It's industry by industry. And that is why this is such a difficult labor market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. New rule. In a new year, payroll should come out on the yeah, second Friday of the month. It doesn't feel <laughs> you, right. You, I agree. I Not agree. excited about you, it. Okay. You so want to be depressed, in, John? You know? Do you want to be depressed? Go on. Somebody out on Twitter goes, more talk of debt default in the seven-hour silver plates. I can't. Oh, they want Bramo. They want to, Bramo. To you and I don't exist. We'll catch up with AMH in about 20 minutes <laughs> down in D.C., and Bramo's going to run you through the risk of a debt default in the United States of America. Live from New York City this morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning to you all. It is Payrolls Friday. We're looking for something like 202 k That is in our media and estimate in our survey here at Bloomberg. <laughs> Range is pretty wide, though. You can go to Nomura at 130 or TD at That's 350. Tom, in about two minutes' time, we'll catch up with Priya Misra of TD as that firm looks for 350000 this month. With our guests, we're going to do this differently, folks. Priya Misra here with a fixed income angle on uh, obviously the depth of the fixed income market. And then Tom Purcelli coming up. And I want he owns wage dynamics. I want to talk to him about the wage number that we'll see at 830. Above consensus, Tom Purcelli in the jobs report. And, Bramo, that's been the place to be over the last eight, nine months or so. Here's the issue. What do you do with a 350,000 uh, payrolls report? What do you do with a real blockbuster number? Do you buy stocks? Do you sell bonds? How do you respond to it at a time when uh, the Fed will look at this as a green light to go hard against inflation and create some real pressure? You would expect at the front end yields up and you're expecting the equity market stocks down. That's what you'd expect. Right. What happens by the time we get to the end of the day, I've got absolutely no idea. <laughs> Especially if people are saying, well, you can kind of look past these numbers. There's a weakness around the edges. Sure. And you can see disinflation elsewhere. Well, so I'm then gonna this gonna is just going to end us. up creating profits for the companies and yeah, better than oh, expected kinds on. of earnings. You do two things. One, you listen to John Farrow talk to the Secretary of Labor. I think we'll get some color from that. But the other thing you do is you listen to Michael McKee, who goes beneath the headline data. And it's not just about 202 or the unemployment rate or six other numbers. There's some real nuances under there that can show which part of the economy is moving which way. That's what I'm going to do. Russ Kostrick of BlackRock said it. It depends where you look. Industry to industry, yeah. very different stories. And, and tech and what's been happening with tech jobs hasn't really spoken to the resilient labor market data we've had through most of this week. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, totally unchanged. Unchanged on the session. The S&P <laughs> down on the week for a fifth okay. consecutive week. Tom, we'll see if we can change that a little bit later this morning. And, and this is, you know, this is underneath, folks. This is like 11 ratios. Good morning, Michael Rosenberg and his team who invented this. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index moments ago, John, moves out to new accommodation. Let me double check that. Yeah, we're buttressed right up against more accommodation away from restrictive. This joy in jobs we're seeing and the data that we've seen the last number of days is pushing against where Chairman Powell wants is to be. Is that a problem? Is it a challenge to Powell it is. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do agree with the gloom crew that you need restriction. You know what Dudley's saying. You need higher rates and the market's pushing against Bill Dudley, Mohammed El Arian. You know him better than me, John. You keep track of this. And the answer is the restrictive crew is looking for help right now. Bramo, which one is it? Full Bullard or full Kashkari? And does it matter in between? Honestly, did you ever read those children's books, Choose Your Own Adventure, where you could basically figure out which way you wanted to go and then turn the page to uh, that particular outcome? It feels like that is what we are embarking upon in 2023. And so today, the adventure that I'm going to be looking at is for sure uh, going to be the wages one. With 8.30 a.m., December payrolls report coming out, do wages come in hotter than expected? Perhaps that gives more of a sense of the strength of this labor market, more than even the headline number. At 10 a.m., the other side of this story is the services sector that has been the strongest, that has been really the driver of a lot of the recent inflation. We get ISM services index for the month of December. Do we see it continue to go down the way that we saw uh, with uh, some of the durable goods? with some of the manufacturing with the ISM that we saw earlier this week? Or does it come in hotter than expected, showing what the Fed keeps talking about, which is there is resilience in this economy? And if you are uh, looking for some more Fed speak, we're going to get it with a number of people, quite a few number of people. Atlanta Fed President
President Raphael Bosek, Fed Governor Lisa Cook, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, Kansas City Fed President uh, Esther George, as well as, uh, of course, a host of others, Ben Bernanke, among them former Fed chair, as well as the chief economist of the ECB. Do they all go full Kashkari? Is there a difference between full Bull Bullard and full Kashkari? Or is this basically the same story of a Federal Reserve that wants to raise rates to about 5%, maybe a little bit north of that, and keep it there for a long time, John? We've got to stop saying full Kashkari and full Bullard now, haven't we? <laughs> Are you banning it now? Neil emails in well, from yeah, Minneapolis. One, one too many times. <laughs> Priya Misra joins us now, Global Head of Race Strategy at TD Securities. Priya, fantastic, wonderful to hear from you, as always, and a happy new year to you and the team. Tom wants to talk to you about the yield curve. I just want to set the stage with the estimate over at TD of 350,000. You're above consensus, Priya, at TD. Why is that? So the high frequency numbers that we're tracking for the labor market, they're still very strong. So the seasonals, in our, in our view, are going to add 200, 250,000 to that number. So it's just, you know, there's a lot of talk around less hiring intentions, uh, layoffs. But the, the overall uh, high frequency data for the labor market is still very strong. I think, uh, you know, businesses are hoarding labor. And so I think the labor market is always a bit of a lagging indicator. It's going to be much more of a lagging indicator be because we're going into the slowdown with a very tight labor market. Right. So our view is if you're looking for weakness, it's probably not going to show up today. I, you know, I, I, I'm looking at more high frequency numbers, ISM services, that, that revenge spending in services. Is that starting to moderate rather than in the payroll report today? Uh, Priya, I want to go back to your home run call last year on curve inversion. We're celebrating. We had Anna Wong just on with a great terminal rate call from Bloomberg Economics. We were here December 15th. How is the inversion today, the reinversion, I should say, to 75 beeps? How is that different from the inversion to 79 beeps only, what, 21 days ago? I'm glad you brought that up. I think there is a big difference. The inversion that we saw in, I would say, November into December was more recession fears. I think the, the market became extremely pessimistic about, uh, you know, growth prospects in the very near term. The growth data, I have to say, over the last month is still strong. And we expect another pretty strong uh, payroll report today. The inversion, the, the more recent inversion, I think it's a global rate-driven uh, inversion. If, if you look at what's happened with Burns, it's, and, and why have Burns moved that much? It's more sort of optimism around the inflation view. And I think the market may be a little too optimistic that inflation, I think, has peaked globally. But how quickly does that decline? Our view is it's going to be persistent. It's service-driven. It's very broad-based. It's hard to see how we get from 7% CPI to 2% this year. So I think the market may be a little bit uh, misplaced. But, you know, um, our view is that the Fed is serious. It's not a reaction function uh, issue. I think the market understands the data remains strong. They're going to keep going. So our view is that that inversion might actually invert a little bit more. We might even get to minus 75, minus 80 on two stands as that terminal rate pricing, I think, goes up. Our view is five and a half. Uh, uh, you know, by the time the Fed is done, they're going to have to raise rates at least to five and a half by the middle of the year, maybe even higher. I think nobody's talking about higher. What if inflation doesn't decline? What if service or wage inflation stays high? I think they're going to have to keep, you know, at a slower pace, they can go 25. But I think they're going to have to keep hiking, and that will just prevent that curve from steepening because that front-end rates will keep moving higher. The long end is a, lo is, is, is a longer-term issue. Is growth slowing down? Is the market positioning for a recession later in the year? That's why I think that inversion, I think we have to get used to an inverted curve all this year, in, Priya, in, in our view. What you're saying is is pretty shocking, actually, and it's pretty, a pretty significant call. Uh, Fed funds rate north of 5.5%, possibly uh, with upside potential simply because of how much strength there is, which really goes in the face of even what the Fed themselves are saying, which is that they want to raise rates to a certain level and then hold it there to digest what the effect will be. Why do you push back against that and say, no, they're going to look to crash this economy, which really is the scenario that you're talking about? Well, I think it's it, it comes down to the economic data. Our view is that things don't slow down really until the third quarter. You know, there's still that savings buffer. You look at consumer spending, it's staying very strong. The, the, the labor market is strong. Businesses are hoarding labor. I think it's just going to take a while for the cracks to show. Uh, uh, maybe the cracks are showing up. But on an aggregate basis, with the unemployment rate at 3.7, 3.6, we think today, 
I mean, the, the Fed, which I thought was stunning, their forecast in December was the unemployment rate will rise to 4.6. That tells you their tolerance band. They need the unemployment rate to go up. So that's going to require multiple negative payroll numbers. We think we're very far from that. So the Fed, in our view, you know, they're, they're signaling five, five and a quarter. Um, but really, it's going to come down to timing. If they're going to hike, we think 50 in February, then they're going to downshift to 25. You know, what do they do in May? We think another 25. June, by June, is there enough in the economic data that makes them stop? Or do they go another 25? That's the argument for going a little bit above. We think still five and a half. They can get there, stay there. Remember, QT is also ongoing, which I think matters a lot more. It's not talked about enough. Those 10-year real rates are high. That's imposing a lot of stress, I think, to companies, to households. So I do think the economy is going to slow down. We're actually calling for a recession in the third quarter. But I think, can the Fed respond with inflation high, with wages high? I think they're going to struggle to respond. So I think the market pricing in of these 40 basis points of cuts at, by the end of this year, I think that's too much. The Fed is going to be late. I think they'll be forced to just sit tight at five and a half or, or, or wherever they end up until they see signs that the labor market has cracked enough where the unemployment rate is above 4.6, I think, for them to start to, uh, to, um, to cut rates. Priya, this was fascinating. What an outlook yes. over at TD. Priya Misra there of TD Securities. Happy New Year to you, Priya, as always. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's a happy New Year That's for anyone who likes to listen to that. So let's go through the calls. 550 on Fed funds. Curve inversion oh, through the whole of this much. year. I... Recession may be at the back end and a Fed that's unable to respond to it as it waits for the labour market data to really crack. I'm going to dovetail here. This is really important, folks, what you heard from Misra of TD Securities, and this is on the x-axis, the time function. Curve inversion for the entire year. Dovetail that with Deborah Cunningham, not on the sell side, on the buy side at Federated Hermes in, in Pittsburgh. And Deborah Cunningham is saying you're going to be lucky to clip a coupon this year. Dovetail those two views together. And this is the when of it out the X axis across this uh, mysterious year. The essence of the argument that Priya is making is you're not going to get that rally at the front end of the curve. You're not going to get that steepness that comes from <clears throat> the bull steepener, which is when the Fed starts to cut I interest think rates. needs to be medicated. That's basically, the argument she's making: you get to 550, you wait there, curve inversion the rest of this year. You're not going to get bailed out with rate you okay, cuts. I'm, I'm just fascinated. I'm great. I think this is really interesting. I could dig into this for the rest of the show. Equity's unchanged. Go. Forget about jobs day. We're doing bonds with Bramo. One hour and 20 minutes away from the payrolls report in America. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Today's U.S. jobs report will help determine what the Federal Reserve, Reserve does next on interest rates. Now, the estimates are that employers added fewer jobs in last month. That indicates a cooling in the labor market that would reduce the need for higher rate hikes. But data released Thursday shows that the job market is still resilient. Inflation in the Eurozone has returned to the single digits for the first time since August. And that's fueling hopes that the bloc's worst ever spike in consumer prices has peaked. Prices in December were up 9.2 percent from a year ago. Slower growth in energy costs was a big reason. And Republicans making history on Capitol Hill. Party dissidents have blocked Kevin McCarthy from becoming Speaker of the House on 11 ballots. That's a post-Civil War record. The standoff has left Republicans fractured after they reclaimed the majority. McCarthy has offered concessions to hardline conservatives, but so far he hasn't been able to get enough votes. And the clock has started on Vladimir Putin's 36-hour ceasefire in Ukraine for the Russian Orthodox Christian holiday. Ukraine has dismissed the truce as a ploy. President Vladimir Zelensky called it a bid by Moscow to get a break in the fighting to step up the war. That holiday travel meltdown is prompting Southwest Airlines to revise its financial outlook. The airline canceled more than 16,000 flights over the last 11 days of the year. Southwest estimates that it costed up to $425 million in lost revenue. It expects to report a net loss for the fourth quarter. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I found it interesting 
Uh, he was ready to uh, um, bomb hospitals and nurseries and uh, um, churches and uh, with the, uh, with the, with the, on the 25th and New Year's. And I mean, you know, I, I, I think he's trying to find some oxygen. The President of the United States on Russia. We'll continue that story in just a moment. From New York City, it is Payrolls Friday. We are one hour and about 12 minutes away from the payrolls data. Looking for something in and around 200k. Your jobs number just around the corner. Your market action looks like this on the S&P 500. Futures totally unchanged on the S&P 500. Deal tired by about a basis point on a 10-year to 372.53. And euro dollar following Eurozone CPI a little bit earlier this morning. CPI on a headline coming in softer, but core core is still a problem for this European Central Bank. Euro dollar a break of 105. Tom 104.92. We're negative there a third of one percent. Yeah, but DXY with a little pop rounded up to 106. I mean, there's some really interesting trends here in the jobs report. I don't want to underplay it, John. You know, no, I, I, I hear there, you. There's, there's some, I, I'm riveted on the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. You can look at the other ones if you want, but I, I mean, they're, they're all there. Let's do this. Let's dash to Emory Horton in Bloomberg in Washington, and we're going to pretend Kevin McCarthy doesn't exist. We've been, you know, overwhelmed by this story. It is, for those of you internationally, there's no other story in America but right now. But let's pretend there is. And within the warm weather of Europe, Emory, it is mm -hmm. a ceasefire by one side in the war. Just let me go to the basics here. Do you have any reporting that Ukraine will honor the ceasefire? Zero. And they've come out and said that publicly. They yeah. really view this as a ploy and a sham. And uh, as you heard the president say coming into your program, the fact that Russia had strikes on Ukraine during uh, the Western Christmas Day, during New Year's, which in you know, the Eastern European, especially Ukrainian Russian cultures is an incredibly important holiday to celebrate. Why would he stop now? And largely everyone just views this as breathing room. And really you have to just caution, and we've been saying this for years now, you have to really be able to look at what Putin says and what actually he does. So for the Ukrainians, it makes no point to abide by this ceasefire, give Russian the room they potentially right. need to move around some military, to move around some ammunition, and then come out and, and strike on them. They I, don't want to give them any inch. Total unfair question, but you're good at this. Amory Horton, I believe the zeitgeist is Ukraine is winning the war. Does President Biden, the Secretary of Defense, do they think Ukraine is winning the war? Um, well, they haven't actually come out and publicly said those words. What they have said is that they will continue to support Ukraine until the very end. And the fact of the matter is, is that Ukraine was able to get back about 40 percent of the land that Russia was striking on very early on. And at this moment, over the past prior months, what you have seen is Ukrainians being able to really push back on Russia. And in that sense, when you're looking at the picture right now, it does look like Ukraine is in the lead in terms of winning this war. Uh, this is why you have, um, which also is a testament really to Putin, a testament that the West is going to band together. You have some, I think G0 um, called it light tanks from France, but really heavy duty uh, infantry tanks coming from Germany, coming from the United States, that number's almost 100, and then another Patriot missile battery coming from Germany. They want to make sure that Ukraine can keep this up. Amory, I wanted to talk to you about that, Germany's contribution. I think Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, has been criticised many times over the last year about a lack of contribution from Germany to the war effort in Ukraine. How much of a big change was that? This is a huge change. I mean, it's not as many as the Bradleys that the United States will be sending over, but still, it is a huge directional change, especially the Patriot missile. Think about this. The United States is also only sending one, and they decided that last month. And now you have Germany falling on the heels of that U.S. decision also, and this is something Zelensky has been asking for. They said, we do not have the armored materials, the tanks, similar to the way the Russians have, and we need to be able to close the skies. And with the Patriot missile battery, they are one step closer to doing that. How much is this really also making good, Anne-Marie, on this pledge to reach that 2 percent threshold of GDP, to reach NATO of spending in military? How much is this really ramping up rapidly of Germany to fulfill this pledge for the first time, really, in decades? Well, it certainly is. And exactly, that's the point. In decades, Germany has fallen far away from that 2 percent target for years, and what you're hearing from NATO, and what Stoltenberg is talking about, is that potentially NATO may just 
change this all to not be a 2% aim, but a 2% minimum for NATO alliance countries that you have to be able to spend on defense budget. And what Germany is doing is maybe just potentially getting ahead of that. But as Jonathan said, they've right. come under a, num a lot of criticism. And at this moment, they are coming to the Ukrainian help. I'm sorry, AMH, we got to go there. We have a wonderful listener out on Twitter who was very polite. He said, can she talk about, can AMH talk about the debt default silver plates? So let's go there uh, right now. Uh, Alexandra Harris writes it up for Bloomberg. Are you kidding me? We really have to talk about a debt default now? Well, people are concerned, although the markets don't seem to be concerned at all, and they just are shrugging off the theater that is going on on the House floor. But people are concerned that if Kevin McCarthy is unable to get his own party to even vote for the basic, what is largely ceremonial, his speakership, how is he going to get these individuals to vote to lift the debt ceiling? And this is why so many people are saying this should have been done in the lame duck session but obviously those Democrats in the House didn't have those in the uh, Senate side to go on board with it. And this just sets up a huge fight. Yeah. This, you know, it's we're starting to hear whispers of it now, and especially in the circles and the individuals we speak to. Wait till the early summer. If this yeah. becomes an issue, uh, this is really going to start to, right. I imagine, freak out many individuals on Wall Street. John Alexander Harris has a drop dead date of sometime in late summer. Cancel that vacation. Late summer. Oh, late summer. Is that coincided with Jackson Hole? Yeah, that's a very August, good. Around, around that kind of yeah, time. That'll be good. We'll have the that'll full attention out. of the, okay, full coverage. the institution. Late summer. That's hard to look out for, isn't it? <clears throat> to really start to discount and think about. Don't you think, Lisa? Are you just setting me up? Because no, I was, no, well, I'm, I'm interested in your thinking. Are we going okay. to Jackson Hall? I was, thinking, we're going to Jackson I, I was Hall? thinking about really? why markets are not responding more to the potential for a debt default, since that seems to be imminently where this this House is going to, this House of Representatives. And you said, well, it always gets fixed, right? You say, well, who cares See, at this point? But then, this is, the oh, this is the issue. This is the issue. This is ripe dysfunction in Washington, D.C. We have seen this movie before. In 2011, it had a serious effect on markets. Yeah, sure. What's going Fair. to stop us from getting back to that point, considering this doesn't set a very good precedent? Almost every single time we do this, we buy treasuries, right? Is that well, going to change anytime soon? You know, that's the real question, right? What is the implication for <clears throat> markets? Is it the haven trade, sell stocks, by, by treasuries. Does that equation change now that inflation is a concern, that the Fed's monetary policy is a different kind of tool to offset any potential disruption? Does that change the narrative? And I think that that's a great question. I mean, honestly, you could say debt default, but what that's going to do on markets, Post who knows? takes it back to 1862. Oh, that's fine. And then 1933. Okay. And what did we learn back then? We learned that McCarthy could be speaker. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. i got to go back and watch Lincoln this weekend. Can we just predict the jobs you know? number in an hour instead of What's going to that would be simpler to do, August. to stay focused here 26 okay. minutes away from what matters. Out. got no idea what that looks like either. Tom Porcelli is <laughs> going to join us and talk about it of RBC Capital Markets. Did we thank AMH? I, you know, I think we did. Really? Did you? I did. You were meant to wrap that up. Oh. Anne-Marie, okay. thank you. We appreciate it. Bye, Anne-Marie. If that's your bye. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> sound like the sound of music or something. That's what he sounds like when he ends I, phone Valerie, conversations. He sings. Valerie. Yeah. Bye. Manus Cranny used to do that. Really? He'd sing like Disney songs, though. Like, really strange <laughs> Is stuff. Is that Valerie. when he hung up or when you hung up? Two in the morning in London, he's on the phone to someone who starts singing Disney songs. I, I never understood. You're going to be talking to Marty Walsh never today and he's going to go climb every mountain. You think he's going to sing? He's going to sing. I yeah. doubt it. Can we talk about Tom Porcelli coming up next? <laughs> he's very good. You're another trying. above consensus call on payrolls, I think, so we'll break that down with him. Some of the calls coming through, 350 at the high end, Nomura kind of towards the low end at 130 or something like that. 200,000 is your median estimate in our survey. The payrolls report about an hour away, futures not doing much, unchanged on the S&P 500. Yields high by almost a basis point, your 10 year, 372.53. minutes away from the payrolls report in the United States of America. Let's get straight to it and check out a price action for you. On the S&P 500, we're going absolutely nowhere on the S&P. Unchanged this morning, down on the week. I said it a few times already this morning, heading for a fifth consecutive weekly loss on the S&P 500. Longest losing streak on a weekly basis, coming all the way back 
to May. Looking at the bond market, shaping up as follows. Through Thursday, yields lower on a 10-year by 15 basis points, a big decline in the face of some pretty resilient labour market data so far this week. We can touch on the ISM and what's happening with the PMIs a little bit later. But for now, your 10-year, 372.35, your two-year, 447.29. And the call from TD's Priya Misra in the last 20 minutes or so. Fed hiking rates to 550 and pausing. Yield curve stays inverted all year. Recession begins in the back half. That's just the US. Let's talk about Europe. Euro dollar shaping up as follows on the euro, the single currency in and around 104 today, 104.92. Break of 105 a little bit earlier. We're negative a third of 1%. And as I mentioned, Tom, CPI in the eurozone still a problem for the ECB. It is not moving in the right direction for core, at least. Well, the headline coming in maybe in the way people anticipated. Th this is important two days ago. And frankly, John, your core analysis on Europe is more important 48 hours on because Cunningham and Misra both say extend the duration. What if you extend core CPI? What does it mean for Lagarde? Frankly, what does it mean for a rebuilding Germany, the fiscal support that Ukraine needs? All these questions are more enhanced than they were two days ago. We closed that 2022 with Chairman Powell, I think, reflecting on a more balanced outlook than perhaps he was looking at a few months previously. But for the ECB, I think we've got to remember this as we closed out 22. We all took that nice long holiday. I hope you did at home too. And then forgot <laughs> that the, the news conference from President Lagarde over at the ECB, that was the most hawkish ECB news conference I have ever seen with President Lagarde. Oh, Tom, she was so blunt and to the point. There was no on the one hand this, on the other hand that. It was, we're going to go again, we're going to go again, and we need to do a whole lot more. She's got to speak to her constituencies, and that was, let's call it a Bundesbank speech, not to editorialise, but... Hey, Tom, I couldn't agree with you more. Was. That was a Bundesbank news conference. In fact, picking up after it, I almost said that was the Bundesbank meeting over at ECB HQ. How have we, exactly had, a, what it how have we like. had a dud of free 2023? We're going to sort that out soon. We gotta, We've we'll been back for our four back. days. He, like, took another four, four days. days on. Is that I, know. It? I know. You said it's already been a long year. It it is a day away from saying Happy New Year, no more, right? Yeah, I mean, that's like, you that's, said. That's the deadline. You told me that. I stopped immediately, and you already you got haven't rid of your said tree. it. You haven't said it. I never. I haven't wished anybody a Happy it. New Year. All right. Well, just growl. You've never wished anyone a Happy New I'm Year. I'm just kidding. I wished you a Happy New Year. You wish everybody didn't happy, wish happy, happy New Year. Happy New Year. Didn't mean it. Can we talk about some interesting sure. moves that are going on Tesla. in the market right now? Oh, Tesla. Man. Look at Tesla shares. They're down more than 6%. And the why of this is more interesting. Those shares have absolutely been bombarded. We've heard about all the situation with Elon Musk and questions around shareholders, what they want to do with him. But the latest one is really more interesting from a fundamental demand issue. They are lowering their prices further in China, which now means that certain cars by Tesla in China are more than 40% cheaper than cars in the the U.S. of the same kind of make. Just to give you a sense, what this suggests is a real weakness in demand and a difficulty in comp competing with local brands. This raises some serious questions, and it's not just for Tesla. 96, it was under $100 in August of 2020, I believe. That's when we were last there. Well, this has been a really marked move, and it really suggests a, a broader slowdown, which people are wondering about. Bed Bath & Beyond, we were talking about yesterday. Uh, them yesterday. They filed a going concern, potential for bankruptcy. What's interesting to me is that those shares were down almost 30 percent yesterday. Today, they are down more than 14 percent in pre-market trading, just to give you a sense. And I'm looking at Lululemon because Wells Fargo raised them to overweight. And I'm curious whether people are going to keep buying clothes to run in, um, you know, even if they're, they're heading back to <laughs> My Lululemon to wardrobe's a little light Do you know right how now? I saw running yesterday? <laughs> Loved it. We started laughing. So I come so back hard. to work because I do double shift. You know how oh. you guys clear out. Oh, give me So I came break. back to work at about 11. Bramma runs out, just like sprinting out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> sprinting. Like, you, know, you know people come out for a run after work or something. I don't yeah, know if you do that. Like I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. But you might come out and just sort of like warm up, gauge the temperature, how you're feeling, sort of stretch out a little bit. Jog lightly. <laughs> Bramo just comes past me. Whoosh, well, like sprints. He just starts sprints. laughing. He's carrying his suit and looking really, you I'm know, debonair. I'm he in was tears. hysterically laughing. Can't stop laughing. Do you do that every day? Yes, I do. You sprint home. I sprint you home. maintain that pace as well. Yeah, yeah, I do. For how long? For a half hour. That is it's, nuts. Well, how else do you have efficiency? If you have kids, you're juggling work, you want to make sure you get I your know, reading in. I know, but that's in. a real pace you were at. <laughs> yeah, it's just... You call that a martini. <laughs> what, what were you running away from? <laughs> just getting away from work. What, what, what are we doing next? <laughs> Let's, Tom get, let's save ourselves right. exactly. with, um, I guess I'll bring in Mr. Porcelli. Tom Porcelli with his folks. And when you become acclaimed on Wall Street, there has to be a reason. And his reason dovetails with payrolls today. He is definitive 
on wage dynamics. Tom Perselli, what do you look for with Mr. Powell's wage inflation metrics this morning? Uh, good good morning, all. Um, is it too late to still say Happy New Year? I don't know how that works. Yeah, you can well, still say it. Uh, Go ahead. I, I, say I, it heard, Lisa. I heard Lisa doesn't say it. Is this, is this right? <laughs> Fake <laughs> news. <laughs> um, so, first of all, sorry I'm not able to be on video. I guess we had some uh, issues here um, on our floor. But, um, look, uh, Tom, I, I think... You know, there's there's countless ways of looking at at, at wages, um, and uh, you know, in fact, I would actually argue there's too many ways of looking at wages, right? I mean, I think a lot of people made a big deal about yesterday's ADP report uh, with um, the the job changers number, you know, still remaining pretty firm. Uh, you know, it's funny to me that that people talk about how it's you know it's at 15 percent. Um, oh, yeah, but it's it's down from like 17 percent, right? I mean, uh, you know, and again, I'm not saying that's not a big number. It's it's an enormous number. Um, but if you look at like the Atlanta Fed's wage tracker number, they have the same uh, similar number, uh, sort of a job changer number. Um, you know, that number is half the pace. So I, I just think, you know, just as a PSA, like, like you know, let, let's just be careful with all these 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 wage numbers and 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 the rates that they're running at. But what I think is definitive, um, no matter which one you want to look at is they're, they're all doing the same thing. They're all rolling over. Um, now, again, I think people hear rolling over and they immediately jump to this sort of this, this end result of, oh, well, that means things are you know, really going to sort of you know, um, right. um, get tossed in the trash. That's not what we expect. I mean, we expect that um, there will be continued slowing. But, it, you know, you're getting back basically toward where we were pre, pre-pandemic. That's a totally reasonable outcome. In fact, right. I think that's a great outcome. I mean, that's probably where we're going with this. So, you know, if you look at our growth forecast over the course of 23, it's, you know, and again, uh, consistent with right. what I've just said. It's not like we expect, um, you know, economic activity is, is going to fall into the, in, into the tanker here. It's not going to. I mean, we think it actually be right. fairly decent, um, but it's going to slow. Tom, linked together today's labor report and your relative optimism there with a hugely accommodative trend for whichever financial conditions index you want to look at. Bloomberg uh, BFCI this morning is a shocking negative negative 0.19 standard deviations. Link the new accommodation trend with today's labor report. Yeah, you know, look, and I think it was as deep as what, minus a standard deviation, I think, right? Yes, negative one. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I mean, Look, I think that the the, the, the bottom line is um, we're still in, in a very accommodative backdrop. Um, uh, you know, that's just uh, that is the the reality of, of of where we are. We think that as a result of that, um, you know, again, it's but there's an irony on in all of this on, on some level. I mean, Q4, the 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 Q4 that just passed. I mean, that might have been. I mean, we'll get that number in I guess another couple of weeks. That may have been the strongest quarter for growth. In 22, right? I mean, who, who, who would have thought that, um, uh, you know, sort of given everything that's happened here? What we know uh, as the sort of the quarter was coming to an end is that the consumer was losing some momentum, right? I mean, and I think that loss of momentum will certainly drag on into, uh, into Q1. And, but again, I think Q1 will be a positive number. Um, I just think it's going to be less positive than, than, than what well, was hold on in a Q4. Second. So, so, the, so, the, so the, 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 the level of accommodation, I think, still remains um, fairly accommodative. Tom, I want to get your sense, and I was really yeah. looking forward to having you, especially after Priya Mesra. I'm trying to square this idea that there's real strength in the market. Yeah. You're seeing a bigger than expected uh, jobs number that, that will come down the pike in yeah. a little less than an hour. And yet you still think that the Fed is torpedoing the economy by continuing to raise rates and that they shouldn't yeah. go much further and yeah. that really they've done enough. How do you square those two ideas? Yeah, I, I think it's actually pretty easy. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we've, we've, I think we need to be mindful of is that there's been an enormous amount of uh, um, uh, accommodation removal um, put into place, right? I mean, that this is the most aggressive hiking cycle that, that, that we've seen. Um, w- w- what we need to be mindful of is what is the Fed really trying to, to achieve here? They're trying to basically slow inflation, right? I mean, I think that's been pretty clear. Um, and the, the reality on that is inflation is slowing down. Now, we can all have a reasonable um, um, discussion or argument or debate or whatever about the degree to which it will continue to slow down. But I don't think it's uh, uh, debatable that it is slowing down. We think it will actually slow down pretty meaningfully over the coming uh, year for reasons that I've outlined many times in our notes and, and on your show. Um, so our view is if it's already happening, right, if inflation is already slowing down, and you already have signs, nascent signs, to be sure, um, that labor is starting to slow. And again, we're above consensus for today, but we think that there are signs that you know we're going to continue to slow down. 
um, then we would argue that there's, it's no longer necessary to continue to be as aggressive um, as the Fed has been. And look, here's the thing, at least, and I guess the punchline on all this is maybe the joke is on us, because this hiking cycle is virtually over, right? I mean, we have the Fed getting up to five and a quarter um, uh, by the time all is said and done. So that's just two more meetings away, basically, by the time the Fed is, is, is done with this hiking cycle. So I think the Fed is acutely aware of this, too. Um, I think now the, the question is how much slowing have they actually put in place, given their aggressive hiking cycle? And that's, I think, where sort of the debate is probably going to sort of sit for 23. Hey, Tom. Happy New Year. This was great. Tom Porcelli of RBC Capital Markets. Thank you, sir. And sorry about the technical problems a little bit earlier. TK it's mentioned wonderful. Neil Dutter of Renmac. Then right on cue, this popped up in the <laughs> inbox. Here we go, Tom. Written incomes will be strong in Q1. Neil says, in addition to gasoline pump prices, households will see two tailwinds for disposable income. Number one, he says food prices. And two, Utility bills, he goes on to say, TK, unless the labour markets completely fall out of bed, an unrealistic assumption, given what we are seeing in claims, surveys, etc., real incomes will look very strong this quarter. Across the Bloomberg moments ago, nat gas, 18-month low in New York trading. Dovetails right into it. He's seeing a reacceleration in the economy, and I think that speaks <clears> to <throat> what Tom Porcelli of RBC was saying just moments ago, that 4Q, Lisa, could well be the best quarter for economic growth of the year. But then he says that there is enough deceleration that the Fed might be toward their end of their hiking cycle. The difference between what he was saying and what Priya Misra was saying to the same oh, potential huge, strength huge is massive, difference. with Priya Misra yeah. saying that the Fed's going to have to go much further and Tom Porcelli yeah. saying, not so much. They can sit here can, and wait, which is two very different views. Can we have a moment of jobs day silence for Matthew Lozetti and Deutsche Bank sure. who nailed the win of a recession? They were laughed at when they said late 2023. We're not there they were yet. Laughed at. How long should the silence be? Um, I don't you know. A couple of seconds. Yeah, a couple of seconds. <laughs> right, go. No. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. That was nice. Was that for Deutsche Bank? Are we still calling it the Time Warner Center? Is it the Deutsche Bank Center now in New York City? I can't get there. I just can't get there. No, can't get there. Well, do you call the Triborough Bridge the RFK Bridge? Does anybody do that? The Deutsche Bank Center. Can't get there. Just I can't get there. Coming up, Dan Ives is going to weigh in on this. He's not. He's going to weigh in on Tesla and Apple. I'm next. Apple. Well, actually, Tesla 103. Wow. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Kevin McCarthy's fight to become Speaker of the House drags into a fourth day. After a historic 11 rounds of voting, the California Republicans still couldn't lock in all the votes needed from GOP dissidents to hold the position, despite offering concessions on House rules. Now, McCarthy and some of his supporters said they will press ahead with negotiations no matter how long it takes. U.S. authorities are ramping up the pressure on Sam Bankman Freed's inner circle. Bloomberg's learned they are now scrutinizing one of its close associates at the bankrupt FDX crypto exchange, Nishad Singh. Now, Singh hasn't been accused of wrongdoing, and it's unclear if he is cooperating with investigators or will do so. In the U.K., a threat from the head of one of the biggest transport unions. Mick Lynch warns there could be a coordinated wave of strikes involving tens of thousands of public sector workers. The U.K. is in the midst of a series of strikes involving transport and health workers and other parts of the civil service. In China, Tesla has made another round of price cuts on its Model 3 and Y electric vehicles. The starting price for a locally built Model Y SUV has been slashed to $38,000, 43% cheaper than in the U.S. Tesla is cutting prices as it faces competition in China. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Big tech is ridiculously profitable. Yes, companies are going to try to manage costs that arguably climbed up a little too much during the, the euphoria post-pandemic. But the reality is these are still very profitable companies. 
That was Russ Kostrick, the portfolio manager at BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. We'll talk about the tech story in just a moment. Equity futures right now unchanged on the S&P 500, almost down about a tenth of 1%, but no real drama here. Yields higher by almost a basis point on a 10-year to 372.53. The tech story of the week so far, cuts. Amazon, Salesforce, the latest tech companies announcing layoffs. The job cuts coming after two years of pandemic era success. Tom Forde of DA Davidson, Wang in. If you look at Salesforce laying off 10,000, you look at you know big tech company du jour with more layoffs, is that to some extent, there was some element of bloated headcount. So you had a very tight job market, especially in the technology area, and you had companies that ramped their headcount very significantly. Some of it was a miscalculation of demand. And CK, this is where we are. We've got to unwind some of that excess now, the excess of the last couple of years. Yeah, there's no question about it, the pandemic blood. And I, I'm going to cut a major slack on this. I've said this before, and these are very different businesses, very different margins, but they all did the same thing given a medical crisis. They had to guess. Well, they had massive demand. <clears throat> Tom, let's talk about the explosion of hiring. The numbers out of Amazon are just... They're unimaginable, but, they're but just that's, nuts. come on, it's the same with went, their airplanes, their trucks, it's unimaginable. Oh, no, Tom, to, to add a it's million nuts. people to the workforce yes. of a single company in, yeah. in what, three years? It's just phenomenal. Yeah. We're going to do this. I just used my fancy new iPhone to take an expanded shot here of Lisa Abramowitz, Jonathan Farrow, and our guest Dan Ives. He is Senior Equity Research Analyst at Wedbush Securities, and we're supposed to talk Apple, except Tesla's not cooperating. So we will go over to Tesla printing a 103.00. Do you have in your head a price of Tesla where Miss, Mr. Musk's world unravels? Look, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, but I will say that, look, about 60 to $70 dollars of the sell-off has been must Twitter-driven. Now, now, clearly, this part is the demand story, the price cuts that we're seeing in China. But I believe, look, at $100, hours, we're getting to a point that I believe this is starting to get to just a massive risk war to own, despite going into a Q4, where clearly they're going to lower guidance, and I think that's really the fear. Can you help me understand the demand backdrop? particularly in China, specifically in China. Do you think that was off the back of the lockdowns, just a lack of spending more broadly in that economy, or off the back of competition? I'm trying to work out what lasts here and what fades. Yeah, I think about 30 to 40 percent of it is what I view as COVID-driven in terms of the lockdowns and, and really what we've seen in country. But but no doubt, I mean, it's an arms race that's happening in China, from, from Neo, Xping to, you know, called 20 or 30 other OEMs that are really going after Tesla. But when I look at the EV market in China, we're still in the second, third inning. I just view this as the market going from hyper growth to more moderated growth in just the face of a recession. When they reopen, I think a lot of people would make the argument right now that this is a more nationalistic Chinese consumer. When they reopen and they've got the spare cash to spend and buy a vehicle, are they buying Teslas or are they going local? Well, that's been the debate. And ultimately, the brand of Tesla continues to really be unmatched. And I think that's why the, if you look at the Chinese consumer, especially on the higher end, if they're going for EVs, I'd say two of every three is going for a Tesla. Now, the problem is competition, price competition, what does that do to margins? And that's why the clock struck midnight for Tesla in terms of hyper growth. And that's what you're seeing reflect in the stock. Although, the, as we said, 70 percent of the sell off, we believe, has been Musk Twitter driven. All right. Well, and not to get into the whole drama there, but there is this question. If you strip out the 30 percent that isn't related to that, how much Tesla is representative of a bigger story within the tech sphere, in particular that you're seeing with a lack of demand, a saturation after so much buying of certain types of electronics during the pandemic? How much have we already seen a right sizing in some of the tech companies as they do layoffs versus there more to be go more to, more room to actually cut. Well, first of all, tech companies. If you look the last four or five years, I mean, they were spending money like 1980s rock stars. So at that pace, if you look at it, that was not sustainable. Clearly, now going into a recessionary environment and what I'll call a hangover <laughs> post COVID, from a growth perspective, you're going to see the cuts. But I look, I view the cuts similar to as I viewed them in 09. And 0102, it's ultimately the start of a right sizing that leads to the next up cycle. Is this Silicon Valley adulthood upon them? Given crisis, and they saved us all with the cardboard boxes when we couldn't go out, just as one example. But is it now finally Silicon Valley with cost cuts, with shocks financially, 
finds a new adulthood, a new sobriety to act like other American companies. I think they're transitioning toward that, toward that adulthood, because I think they've learned from their mistakes. And I think also— Microsoft never had this problem. Well, look, if you look at Redmond and how Microsoft did, ultimately they've been tacticians, as long as I'd say with Apple, in terms of everything that Cook's done. But I think when you look at the rest of tech— I mean, it was really an arms race to really outspend because of the, the, the talent level and what demand looked like. And now what's really happening is I think we go into this Q4 earnings, numbers get cut. I believe Texas under owned today is 2009, the New York City cab drivers bearish on tech. And then I think we sit here February, March, April to spend also what happens on macro. And I think tech stocks rip higher from here, despite sentiment, which you know many yell and fire in a crowded theater. But you think we've got to go through a kitchen sinking moment for guidance. The kitchen sink we get has there. to happen the last two weeks of January across the board. And that, in my opinion, marks what I view as a, a core bottom. So the real question for a lot of people then is how much more downside is there off the back of that kitchen sinking moment? Or do you think that kitchen sink leads to a rally because you get this relief? Whisper numbers usually are, I'd say, 8 10% above street. Today, they're probably 8 to 10% below the street. And I think that's the difference. From an institutional perspective, you've already seen <clears throat> buy side numbers come down across the board. A lot of bad news baked in here. And look, fundamentally, especially on enterprise, software, cybersecurity across the board, I mean, we're seeing 93, 95% deals still get done. And also remember, if you look at Apple, given everything we saw with COVID in terms of China, all the supply chain issues, you would be like, okay, they're going to pre announce negative, not even a question. They already announced their date. So, again, it just goes to a point. Demand, despite what I think, you know, in terms of the clock striking midnight in the eyes of many, I think is holding up better than expected, specifically in Cupertino. The story of 2022 was a real bifurcation of big tech. It was no longer big tech. It was specific industries that they're catering to with technology as their preeminent business. Are there any big tech companies that you don't think will revive, that you don't think will be underpriced, that you think could kitchen sink it and then have to kitchen sink it again later on this year? Yeah, I think that's really more on the social medias. I mean, like when you look, let's say, where a meta play is, that – they have significant headwinds because of what's happened on Apple, iOS, and just digital advertising and, and obviously more money spent to a metaverse. But yeah. it also goes back to it. They cut costs. Look at that stock since Zuckerberg actually peeled back spending. Uh, John, let's look at this. This is the reality. Take a photo, run it to 48 megapixels, which is the new magnificent resolution. Oh, you love this phone, don't you? Edit it in another app, throw it out to uh, Treehouse sitting in the studio. She nails it, gets it done, and we get it up in 12 seconds. That's the Dan Ives world. You love this camera, don't you, over it, Apple? I do. I do. I love the chip. No, no, let me rephrase this. This is Help me here. Mm -hmm. The chip is what matters. Nobody in the financial media talks about the A this or the A chip in whichever toy you're talking it's about. It's the biggest innovation to come out of Apple in the last six to seven years in terms of chips. They own, they're basically being Intel at their own game. Dan Ives, fantastic to see you. Dan no, Ives, great to be here. Thank you. Just brilliant. Shares your stylus, TK. Yeah, he Similar does. Wardrobe. I mean, he's looking great. I mean, you know. Loving the jacket. Bit of color for New Year. It's great. This is what we're about. We had Tom Forte yesterday from Davidson and Dan Ives today. These guys are encyclopedic on this stuff. It's not a lot of blah, blah, Look, blah. Look, for some like, of these tech firms, think about how long they've been around. They've never had to live with 5% interest rates. Yes. And I'd also make the argument in the United States they've never really faced truly a cyclical test. Because the pandemic for some industries, of course, was a cyclical test. For these tech firms, it was not. They got an acceleration of demand. For many of these firms in their current form, yeah. this year could well be, if we do get that recession, the first cyclical test they faced in the United well, that's States. That's a new sobriety I'm talking about. And the other side of it is, and you know, we'll talk to Dan about this in the coming weeks, we're going to go to earnings, I believe, February 2nd for Apple. 27th, I think, January. Of uh, fe Feb's, uh, it's February? Feb Feb it's February. What do we, we get at the end of January? Uh, Tesla, Tesla's Gen, the Tesla, right, Microsoft, okay. the, that'd be the big we, Amazon. We're going to go to earnings, and they're going to go, hey, we're selling all these stupid phones through the mobile phone companies for next to no money. John Farrow needs one of these, don't you think? I don't I, know if I want to upgrade. I, 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 th I think Farrow needs an iPhone 14. Yeah, needs, yeah. Know, really? What is this? I think, I'm rocking, a, I think I'm rocking a 12. Yeah, Still. I think I'm. Yeah. I don't want to change this, Dan. I'm not ready to do that just yet. We'll see. You know, what am I waiting we'll for, the 15, the 16? The yes, the 16. 16. I, okay. 23? 2024, 25. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Something you know, like that. It's good. It'll it's Payrolls Friday. The jobs number is 34 minutes away. The brilliant Nadia Lovell of UBS joins us next.
right now, what we're seeing is a very strong job market. The Fed has to drive up the unemployment rate sufficiently to slow down the economy, to generate slack in the labor market. What we're likely to see is slower and slower and slower non-farm payrolls. It's important not to get distracted by what's happening with the layoffs in the tech sector. It's industry by industry. And that is why this is such a difficult labor market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Jobs Day. Russ Kostrad says it's difficult. We'll have difficulty for you in 29 minutes. John, at the minimum, it's complex. New median estimate, 203. Just ticks hard. Just for you, Tom. 200. 200. That's important. That's important. 200 to 202 Direction to 203. Direction travel matters. And that's exactly. a lot of inertial, really? seriously, inertial force. There. Hey, look, the <laughs> labour market data so far this week has been really resilient. If the ADP is worth anything to you, we got an upside surprise from that. Jobless claims came in really low relative to where they've been historically. You can throw on top of that what we've seen elsewhere with job openings, 1.7 openings for every single unemployed American. The quits rate is elevated. The official labour market data is screaming things are okay. Then you've got a load of other people that think this is as good as it gets and it's going to get a whole lot worse by the time we get to the end of the year. That's a pundit game that we've got right now. Let's go to something fresh. An hour ago, Neil Dutta comes out and says, I'm sorry, real incomes look pretty uh, good. And they do because inflation, particularly in certain important sectors like utilities, is coming in a bit. I want to know what Secretary Walsh says to you this morning. One food prices, two utility bills and the politics. Well, they hope that Neil Dutta's right, don't they? And that the pessimists are wrong. I do and this economy agree. The this president market holds really up. feels Neil Dodd is right. Yes, without a doubt. And let's see what happens, Thomas. You say that's the punditry game. In the here <laughs> and now, looking at the official data, it's hard to make the argument that things are terrible in the labour market. Lisa, please jump in here. I got a I got a Bloomberg Conditions Index negative point one nine, which is telling me Chairman Powell he wants a gloomy report today. Well, that's what I was going to oh, say, please. actually. So this administration might want that strength that Neil Dutta is talking about for this year and maybe until 2024. And then it doesn't because they don't want inflation to keep going. So where does the feds to come into this when what we heard from Priya Misra was that they may have to torpedo this in a way that nobody is prepared for, talking about north of 5.5% Fed funds <clears throat> rate and holding it there for a year. Nobody is well, gaming this out with Fed It's uh, the tightening. holding it piece of it that I think is important. Yeah. There's two phases to this, and this is what Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed was speaking to earlier this week. The first phase is the hiking cycle. Now, maybe we've had the bulk of that. Most people assume we have. Then comes the pause. They believe that the pause is a tool. It's a tool. It's not just a moment in time where you stop there for a month and then the following meeting you start cutting interest rates. I think they really believe that the pause is a valuable tool to wait, look around, until they're absolutely convinced that inflation is heading back towards target. We're going to go to Nadia Lovell of UBS on equities here in a moment on the trend you and I have seen in 48 hours. And, and Lisa, I'm sorry, people are taking that pause and extending it out. Uh, uh, Chamberlain and Federated yesterday, Priya Misra an hour ago was stunning on the duration of curve inversion. And that's why I find it so amazing that the market is still pricing in cuts through the end of this year. So, yes, yeah. you have economists, you have analysts coming out and saying they're going to hold, they're going to hold Fed officials, and the market says, no, you're not going to hold. You're going to cave as yeah. soon as it's John Priam is a curve inversion, 210 spread, the vanilla spread, negative 76 I sound real, isn't it? Unverted, inverted rather, for the whole of this year is the call from Priya. And for those yeah. of you that missed the conversation about an hour ago, TD's Priya Misra is calling for yield curve inversion for the whole of this year. Recession at the back end is the economy call over at TD. And ultimately, a Fed funds, Tom, that goes through 550 and then stays there. That's the call from Priya. Dollar's stronger. Give me some data here, John. I got red and green on the screen on board. Equity's down about a tenth of 1%. That's not going to address your boredom, I'm afraid, Tom. Maybe the number in about 26 minutes will. The jobs report just around the corner. Going into that, yields are higher by a couple of basis points on a 10-year to 373.84. Crude's had a really, really interesting start to the year. Got battered the first yeah. two sessions. Now in and around, Tom, 73.50 on WTI. One eye on Tesla here. It's off the radar this morning, but just printing under 103 gets everyone's attention watching the Musk uh, saga. Right now, we're going to dovetail this length of duration, the duration of 2023 and those ramifications in fixed income over to the equity space. Nadia Lovell joins us, senior U.S. equity strategist, UBS Global Wealth Management. What is the how much of it, the length of it mean, Nadia? How do equities react to a holding Fed, a longer duration inversion, the length that some of these fixed income types are talking about. What do equities do? 
I think it's going to be a challenging market for our equities if you have the Fed on hold for a very long time at a very elevated interest rate. That is going to continue to pressure margins. It's going to continue to pressure valuations. It's also going to uh, overall pressure earnings um, in 2023 as the economy slows down. So I think it's going to be a tough market for the equity market. I mean, even though we have a 3,700 price target for June on the S&P 500. We think that the market is likely going to trade lower than that in the first half of the year as those earnings cuts continue to happen. And we think that that's going to start really with the upcoming earnings season. So the lows are in our future. Nadia, let me talk about the opportunity maybe away from the index level story. Where do you think on a sector basis that opportunity is? You know, we think that the opportunities continue to be in the more defensive areas of the market, like healthcare and consumer staples, and also energy. I mean, as you noted, energy has had a rough start to the year, some of that having to do with oil prices, given the rise in COVID cases in China, and also a warmer than expected uh, uh, winter in Europe. But we think that those factors that really push Brent above $100 in 2022 continue into 2023. We're going to see a uh, continued underinvestment in, uh, in energy and also so Russia uh, production um, disruption continues. Uh, we see the EU oil embargo that went into place in December. And also we're going to have the refined products uh, embargo that goes to place into February. So we think also, you know, the China reopening is going to put offshore pressure on oil prices. So we think that oil gets back above $100 and towards 110 and that should be supportive to the energy sector in 2023. Nadia, can you give us some color from your conversations with clients? How many of them have come to you and said, why should I invest in stocks at a time where I can get four and a half percent reliably on investing in two year treasuries? I think what we're hearing from clients is definitely a mixed bag. I mean, some clients have a lot of dry powder on the sideline waiting for that additional downturn in the equity market to really put that to work. But we are seeing continued interest in the, in the fixed income market, just given where rates are. And that's kind of, sort of been our message as well. I mean, we've continued to recommend high-grade bonds as a way of seeking incomes, as well as structural products where you can get some yield as well and some downside protection uh, if the market uh, should pull back further. So it's been a mixed bag. Some clients are waiting for additional pullback, and some clients are still right side in their exposure to tech because believe it or not, you know, tech has been a dollar for so long and people are still holding on to some of that tech exposure. But we remain least preferred on tech and we still think that there's more downside to tech. So we continue to advise clients to right size that position. This is really interesting, especially because it flies against what we've been hearing from others, including uh, what we were hearing just from Dan Ives of Wedbush talking about the potential for real upside in tech later this year, how much things have already been beaten up. Are you saying, Nadia, that everyone says that they're bearish on tech, but in reality, they're still all overweight and have yet to right size to where we are now and where the expectations are for earnings. Absolutely. We have heard that from some some clients. I mean, when also when you look at tech from a valuation standpoint, this tech sector is still not cheap. I mean, it's still say trading at a 20% premium to the broader market. And even this week, we've heard from mega cap um, software company that it could take some time for that normalization of demand to happen. We saw a massive pull forward of demand in tech over the last two years. And they're saying that they could take two years for that normalization to happen. I mean, even in the semiconductor space, we're seeing some weakness here. We're hearing weakness weakness in, dem in, in demand uh, among the, the cloud service providers and also in data centers. So we still think that there's downside to tech. I mean, we've seen the numerous uh, layoffs. We still think that there's more to come. Nadia, thank you. As always, Nadia Lovell there of UBS Global Wealth Management. That is the second voice in the last 20 minutes or so who's talking up or rather talking down earnings season. Dan Ives of Wedbush said he thinks we get the kitchen sink from the tech players. At the end of this month, the start of February, Nadia Lovell is basically telling you, Tom, she thinks the lows are in our future on this S&P 500. That's the zeitgeist out there. And again, it goes to those conference calls and the guidance forward. I would go up. The, the, the adults are telling me, look at the income statement, EBITDA, et cetera. I would go up and look at what the change expectations are for revenues. If you get disinflation trends, even stasis, you got to believe the revenue growth comes in a little bit. It I starts with that. At least it's on the money. When she asked the question, <clears throat> I think a lot of people right now are saying, why take the risk? I'll take treasuries at 4 or 5%. Thank you. I wonder how much that's a discussion, how much people have to justify equities as an asset class at a moment of such uncertainty when people can actually get income elsewhere. At what point do equities get cheap enough to offer that real offset and the potential upside? Again, 
I don't know how much people are talking about this, but when you talk about cash, it isn't just hiding. It's that you're getting income that might be above the dividend yield that you're getting on many stocks. If you just landed from space and hadn't been around for a few years and heard this recession I'd conversation... I'd go right back to space. Would you, would you, especially if you're listening to this show. <laughs> Correct, go anyway, on. Anyway, and you heard the numbers 200,000 on payrolls, unemployment with a three-handle and wages at five. Would it stack up, Tom, with the recession conversation? We're hearing from so many people about this year, the negativity and the pessimism around the corporation story. And I think Lisa said this, you've said it, I've said it. There's a difference between the arguments you make on the market and the arguments, Tom, you might make on the economy. It's the heart of the matter, and we need to say it with some media humility because we don't have to publish. These people (laughs) have to put something down on paper. And let me make clear, folks, what they put on paper is a lot more important than what they yammer on on Bloomberg surveillance. But (laughs) Nadia Lovell and the rest of them, this is tough. Oh, super tough. Tough. You talked about the outlook beyond three months with any confidence. If you said to me right now, John, if, if you said this to me over a beverage of my choice right now, I would say the single idea I've heard that shows a struggle is Stuart Kaiser, Citigroup, there's just so few things to choose from. That's the feeling I get right now. Big earnings season. JP Morgan next Friday. CPI next, next Friday? week too, yeah. Earnings Friday. Busy time. It'll work. Bramo's disappearing. She's not going to be around for that. She's going to skip CPI. Back. Gonna... <laughs> She's going to skip CPI. She's going to skip JP Morgan Are you serious? earnings. I'm deadly serious. Deadly I was serious. not briefed on this. No, another vacation. Don't tell me anything. Another vacation. A January vacation. My days or your days? <laughs> I think Bramo's days. Whose really? days are you taking? Oh, wait, look at the markets. Look at those markets. <laughs> They're look fascinating. The, Let's stocks? just talk about your boredom, Tom, takes with a vacation this? second week of the year? No one. It's oh, un-American. Bramo does. Bramo does. Happy New Year, guys. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Where's my running to shoes? <laughs> Payrolls are about 20 minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Well deserved, Lisa. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The U.S. jobs report is out less than 20 minutes from now, and it will help determine what the Federal Reserve does next on interest rates. The estimates are that employers added fewer jobs last month. That would indicate the labor market is cooling and that higher rate hikes aren't needed. But data released Thursday show that the job market is still resilient. Republicans are making history on Capitol Hill. Party dissidents have blocked Kevin McCarthy from becoming Speaker of the House on 11 ballots. That's a post-Civil War record. The standoff has left Republicans fractured after they reclaimed the majority. McCarthy has offered concessions to hardline conservatives, but so far he hasn't been able to get enough votes. Sweeping changes on the way at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That's after it faced harsh criticism for its delayed and inconsistent response to the pandemic. The CDC will require all employees to be ready to deploy to combat national health crisis, and that's a drastic shift from a fragmented volunteer system that hampered its response to COVID. The clock has started on Vladimir Putin's 36-hour ceasefire in Ukraine for the Russian Orthodox Christian holiday. Ukraine has dismissed the truce as a ploy. President Vladimir Zelensky called it a bid by Moscow to get a break in the fighting to step up the war. And that holiday travel meltdown is prompting Southwest Airlines to revise its financial outlook. The airline canceled more than 16,000 flights over the last 11 days of the year. Southwest estimates that cost it up to $425 million in lost revenue. It expects to report a net loss for the fourth quarter. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The economy is clearly slowing, but boy, we're not calling for a recession in 2023. We're still there. Uh, I don't think we're actually in the majority with that view, but the fact that the economy is holding up is is part of our view there. Some more constructive take from Seth Carpenter, the chief global economist at Morgan Stanley, going into the payrolls report 14 minutes away. Here's the price action going into that. Your equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. It is down on the week. On a session, it is negative about a tenth of 1%. Yields are just a little bit higher by a couple of basis points at 374. The numbers we're looking for, 202,000 is the estimate in our survey for the month of December. The previous number was 263. The last eight months, we've had upside surprises 
weeks after Upside Surprise, will we get another one? That's the payroll story, the headline number. Unemployment set to stay at 3.7%, according to our survey, <coughs> again. Wages, 5%, Tom. Still looking for that five handle on wages in America. Yeah, the wage dynamic will be important. Thanks to Tom Purcelli for weighing in on that here. And we really dive into it out here at 817 Wall Street and Washington time um, as well. We begin strong with a former governor of the Federal Reserve System economics professor at Booth School of Chicago. Thrilled that Randy Krosner can join us each and every job say, Randy, I'm going to go Steve Levin on you. The great free economics guy, he, what a tour de force of Chicago Steve Levitt has had, was just to pull in the social aspect of where we are, a la Gary Becker. I want you to explain how blind we are on this jobs report, how blind we are on the American labor economy because the overlay of technology. Do we actually know a job economy when we see it, or are we just completely blind off the pandemic given modern technology? I wouldn't want to say we're completely blind, but I, I don't want to go, and I also don't want to go so far to say that, uh, you know, we're, everything's completely unprecedented, we don't know anything. Uh, but obviously things are a little different than they typically are. We've had this historic, um, <laughs> incredible strength in the uh, in the labor market. What's been amazing is the Fed has continued to raise rates, has continued to, to, uh, to tighten, uh, tighten monetary policy. Um, and the labor market hasn't cracked. We've seen the housing market start to turn down. Obviously, we've seen a lot of tumult in the uh, both public equity markets and private equity markets. So asset prices have turned down. We've seen earnings start to come down. But we haven't seen uh, a crack in the labor market. This is unusual. At some point, it's going to happen. Um, and my guess is when it happens, it's going to happen quickly. Our models always say everything moves smoothly. In practice, things always seem to move a little more, more rapidly uh, when they do start to turn. Um, so some uncertainty there. But, uh, right. but I do think at some point the labor market's going to crack. Should your Fed use new models or rely on the Old Testament models? Let's go to the Phillips curve as one example, because the labor market refuses to crack. So they are experimenting in, um, uh, with new ideas and thinking about, well, maybe they can have this, as we sometimes described before, this immaculate disinflation, where uh, we just reduce the number of uh, job openings, because that have been at record levels relative to the number of people seeking jobs. Those could potentially come down um, without the unemployment rate going up dramatically and the um, and wages not uh, and wages start to moderate. We've never seen that before. I wouldn't put all my eggs in that, that basket. It's conceivable. So they're thinking about some alternatives, um, but I tend to be a little bit more traditional, and I think at some point the unemployment rate is start, going to start to go up. Randy, do you believe in the pre miss review of things, that the Fed may have to go to 5.5% uh, by June of this year in terms of a terminal Fed funds rate and hold it there for a significant amount of time in the face of the strength in the labor market that we continue to see? Well, I've been saying this for a long time on your program, that the Fed is going to end with a five handle. Now, whether that's closer to five or closer to six is going to depend on the strength of the labor market, on uh, wage inflation, on uh, other um, uh, other aspects of the uh, of, of economic activity and in inflationary pressures. Um, so I do think it's likely that they will end somewhere be uh, with a five handle, somewhere at five or above, and will hold it for quite some time. Now, that's the challenge because I think the inflation rate will start to come down. But if you ch keep the nominal interest rate at 5%, inflation is coming down, effectively the real rate is going up. That's going to be tightening. And so I think that means that uh, we're likely to get uh, a significant slowdown, uh, potentially even recession. Which is the reason why the market doesn't believe that the Fed will actually have the uh, the gall to keep going with that, to keep it at 5% for a long time. So. How would you push back against that, considering that you could wear that hat? How would you say they do when there'll be political pressure, when they'll be effectively tightening at each consecutive meeting that they hold rates at that level if you do see disinflation and weakness? So I think they've done a lot of the political heavy lifting already because in the uh, it's much easier to hold rates when the unemployment rate is going up than to raise rates when the unemployment rate is going up significantly. So by moving really rapidly through the, the last nine months, uh, they've gotten rates very close to 5%, pretty close to where the terminal rate is. Remember, they started out 
uh, almost at, at zero, and uh, and now we're uh, we're talking around five. So in some sense, I think they've done a lot of the political uh, heavy uh, political lifting already. It'll be tough, but it's much easier to just hold than it is to uh, to be raising when the unemployment rate's going up. Randy Crosser, as you know, you've got a Chicago Jewel and Michael Weber who really writes interesting, intriguing stuff on the social aspect of our American uh, labor economy. And so much of his work, and frankly others at Chicago, is to say our central banks need to take a different tack. Is this a time off this jobs report today where we have to stay on traditional central bank signaling, or do we need to think about new ideas forward out of this pandemic? Well, I think we certainly do need to think about new ideas going forward, because obviously the Fed, as well as every other central bank in the world, got it wrong. They said, oh, transitory, transitory, transitory. <laughs> And that was fine for a few months, but then it was six months and it was nine months that we were hearing this. And it was pretty clear after about three months or, or so uh, that maybe we shouldn't call it so transitory. So I think, one, they need to to learn the lessons from that, what right. could be driving inflation, understanding the supply side uh, in, in more detail, and two, thinking about how they best can, uh, can communicate. Now, fortunately, inflation expectations have not risen. I mean, I think that's pretty amazing, given how much inflation went up, given that they, they yeah. got it wrong, and other central banks got it wrong, that people didn't say, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Inflation's going, you know, going crazy, and so I want, you know, 10% wage increases. They do want bigger wage increases, but inflation expectations haven't gotten out of line. So they've gotten that kind of right so far. Hey, Randy, you're going to stick with us. Looking forward to your coverage as we break down the jobs report coming in about seven minutes' time. Randy Croson, uh, thank you. Mike McKee with us around the table. That makes it official, Tom. You know when Mike McKee turns up in a studio? It's important. You know, it's, it's important. Time. That's yeah. like the, the moment's here. Well, yeah, but the, yeah. what's great about him is entourage, they come before him, so you sort of know they just said, I, I've noticed they clean the table down. <clears throat> yeah, he dusts well, his chair. Have you, you noticed that too? Yeah. I feel like the field goal kicker. I've been standing over here warming up. <laughs> you know. Mike, six minutes away. What are you looking for? Uh, the biggest numbers that we're going to look for is the change in service industry wages versus uh, manufacturing goods producing wages. The Fed's been worried about service industry wages because there's a shortage of employees, so we'll see how how many people get hired there and what they're getting paid and whether that is still putting upward pressure on inflation. Do you believe in this idea that we're starting to see weakness in uh, sort of peripheral uh, jobs metrics aside from the official data or is this really uh, sort of trying to find a needle in a haystack? I think it's trying to find the needle in a haystack. I was thinking about this this morning because you know there's this disagreement about whether the household survey or the establishment survey are correct in the Philadelphia Fed. Uh, added some numbers up and uh, did some calculations and thinks there's a lot fewer jobs created, at least yeah. according to the household survey. But when you look at all the rest of the anecdotal data and all of the rest of the actual data, it doesn't seem that we are seeing a whole lot of weakness. The uh, Fed's beige book said that companies were finding it a little easier to find workers, but then the minutes said that companies wanted to hold on to workers. They don't want to get rid of them. Very quickly, how much of the housing dynamic is in that important service sector data you're going to look at? It's not as much because, of course, construction workers are all part of housing. We have seen declines in mortgage lenders, mortgage lenders uh, and the real estate firms, but that's not a huge component of overall. It's going to be – it's a much bigger deal for the CPI than it is for the okay. jobs report. Did you read the base book? No, I, I if, with he's great he's honor. Doesn't have any trouble let me, sleeping. Let me, so. let me get my tang. To get my tang zero is up here, folks. With great honor to the late Richard Yamarone, always missed. I read the Orange Book. Of course, I'm away. Yamarone got we so angry the about the Beige Book, he invented the Orange Book. What a legend! Yeah, dearly missed. Mike, you're going to stick with us. I'll do that. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. We're about five minutes away from the payrolls report in America. Going into it, equity futures are down by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields are higher by two or three basis points on a 10-year, 374.41. You're familiar with the numbers now. Your median estimate for the headline number is 203,000. The payrolls report up next. The payrolls report 24 seconds away. 
Coming into it, equity futures basically unchanged, down a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Bond yields bleeding just a little bit higher on a 10-year this morning. Yields up by around about two basis points to 373 on a two-year, up by two or three basis points to 448. The number we're looking for, something in and around 200,000 in our survey here at Bloomberg. With the official data, here's Mike McKee. All right, John, we're waiting for the uh, data to drop here, and it comes in mm. almost on uh on forecast, 223,000 jobs created in the month of December, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a little bit better than the 203 that was anticipated, but it is uh, not too far off from that. Let me just see here uh, if we have a... Um I don't have an immediate uh, revision yet, but I'll get to that. Changing private payrolls up 220,000. Unemployment rate drops, drops to 3.5% from 3.7%. That'll get their attention on Wall Street, as Jack Nicholson would say. Average hourly earnings up three-tenths. That's down from six-tenths. That's smaller than was anticipated. And average hourly earnings on a year-over-year -year basis fall to 4.6% from 51 here come the revisions, 256, so a slight revision down in November from December. Again, December 223, and uh, the uh, unemployment rate was re revised down. You don't usually see this to 3.6% in the month of November from 3.7%. So it looks like... Um, we still have a strong labor force here, uh, st strong labor market. Jobs are being created, but average hourly earnings are dropping, and that's got to make the Fed a little bit happier. Uh, one thing interesting here, labor force participation rate ticks up to 62.3 from 62.1. So more people looking for jobs, it appears. We'll dig into that. That's what we're trading on right now. So we've got wages coming in softer. You're seeing the participation rate come a little bit higher and that means equities get a little bit of a lift up by half of one percent on the S&P 500 I think you can guess where yields are we erased some of that move at the front end yields were a little bit higher on a 10-year too now they're only up by about a basis point on a two-year on a 10-year up by about a basis point as well so another upside surprise on the headline number but TK it's the data elsewhere that'll get the attention of many on Wall Street it's those softer than expected wage growth figures yeah, there's no question that's the outlier here. But I go back to the gross number of unemployment rate. You're going to speak with the Secretary of Labor about this, and I'm sorry he's standing up and down cheering. There's all there is to oh, it. Oh, sure. For all the gloom about recession, yeah. it's hard to make the case when we're at 3.5% on unemployment. I, I, for those out there maybe looking for something that might give you a little bit more of a leading indicator of things, Mike, what do you make of hours worked? coming in just a little bit. What do you make of that? Uh, it uh, suggests that companies did not have to work their employees harder, maybe because they were adding workers. Uh, it doesn't m uh, make a, a huge change, but it does indicate a little bit less net income in the economy. Here's something interesting, though. I just saw this here. Uh, the, the establishment versus household, uh, the household number goes up 717,000. So maybe what we had been seeing in the job losses right. on the household side is an anomaly mm -hmm. that has now worked itself out, and the right. two sides will come closer together. Mike, in honor of Professor Krosner, I took the unemployment rate, USURTOT, on the Bloomberg. I took it logarithmic on the y-axis, and the moving average cross just before the pandemic, 3.6-ish, is right where the moving cross is the moving average cross is right now. Have we returned to pre-pandemic labor force? I mean, when you smooth everything else, are we basically back to December of 19, January of 2020? Well, it looks like we're getting there. 439,000 people added to the labor force. And the number of people, there were a number of people out there, and I'll give credit to Steve Stanley, who's been all over this for a very long time from Pierpont, M Amherst Pierpont, uh, that the idea that the labor market's tight enough and there are uh, enough job openings that you could see the unemployment rate continue to fall. And that is what is apparently happening right now. And this is... It's, a, it's an interesting conundrum for the Fed because they're anticipating that the jobless rate should go up sure. so that uh, it will reduce pressure on wages. But instead, the jobless rate falls, but the wage rate falls. Well, right now we're at 3.5%. Mike, thank you. If you are just tuning in, 223,000, the headline number, the estimate 203, so upside surprise. A lot of people on Wall Street focused on the wage growth figure. 
with the inflationary backdrop, the big story coming into 2023 and leaving behind 2022. Wages surprised to the downside. Unemployment at 3.5%. We were looking for 37 That's down from a revised figure of 36 The participation rate just a little bit higher. Looking at the price action, Lisa, I've got to say, not a major move. We're up by about a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. That's the equity market. If I turn to the bond market, yields almost where they were on a 10-year by about a basis point, up by to 372 on a two-year. Not really moving here at 446. This doesn't really clarify much. There is a question of whether there is a bifurcation, and this is what I'm curious as Mike digs through the numbers, versus manufacturing versus services. Where is the weakness versus the strength coming from, and how how big is that bifurcation? How does the Fed view this? Does this push them away from uh, hiking rates more aggressively? Not clear. Oh, right now, let's go back to Randall Krosner. He is a former Fed governor. I want to take this bigger and broader, as Mike, again, as Lisa says, massages the data. This with an equity lift uh, in the market. Bonds indeterminate right now. We have curve, you know, a little bit of curve inversion. I don't want to oversell that. Randall Krosner, to me, this is an Elizabeth Warren jobs report. We are employing Americas, Americans. These are good numbers. We need to revisit this. Why does the Fed want unemployment why do they want us to have less jobs i think that's a huge confusion for our listeners and viewers i think that's right and it's an important point to make because it's not that the fed wants fewer jobs what they want is lower wage growth more um because they're worried about persistent inflation um 70 80 percent of all of the uh, the costs of um uh, of um, uh, of our production in the u.s is related to jobs and, and wages and so if that's going up really fast that can make it very difficult for inflation to come down now this is the immaculate disinflation report um that you're starting to get um lowered wage growth but um, lower unemployment rate, continued uh, high growth in, in jobs. As I had said before, this has never happened before where we've been able to bring the, um, uh, the uh, growth of uh, wages down and the inflation rate down without having the unemployment rate go up. This is one of those new theories we were talking about before that the Fed is putting forward. It would love to see this happen that uh, the, uh, uh, the wage rate growth comes down without a significant increase in the unemployment rate. This is just one month's number, so let's not uh, uh, say that, mm -hmm. that we've got that victory here. But it's consistent with this very optimistic view uh, that uh, that people have, uh, that potential, or that some people have, that maybe we could get through this without a significant recession. Randy, let's say that this is a uh, sign of the immaculate disinflation that you talk about. And let's say we get another read like this next month and the month after. How many does it take for the Fed to adjust, given the balance of risks, that this is not actually an accurate picture and that inflation is still strong and that the labor market is too strong for the Fed's wishes? So they're certainly going to continue to buy, uh, buy insurance. They're not going to say, oh, uh, the uh, the inflation uh, wage uh, inflation is coming down just like overall inflation is coming down. We're done. They're not going to say that at all. They're certainly going to continue to to raise rates at the end of this month. Likely continue to do that in uh, uh, in in March, but it may make it more likely that they go 25 basis points rather than 50 basis points at these meetings. Uh, I think that's really where it's going to be. But they're still going to be buying some inflation because they know that this is sort of a new and untested uh, hypothesis. Um, Maybe it'll work, um, but they're not going to take the risk that, ah, uh, declare victory, and then the wage rates start to go up, inflation rates start to go up, and then they've really got to move in uh, interest rates up because they worry about losing credibility. Hey, Randy, thank you. Just wonderful coverage from you, as always. Lucky to catch up with Randy Croson there of the University of Chicago and, of course, formerly of the Federal Reserve. Mike McKee, we hear from Chairman Powell next Tuesday, don't we? Next week. Uh, I believe so. And yeah, we it's will... going to be interesting to see what he says about this. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be a little bit longer than eight minutes. I, I think the mm. interesting thing here is that um, – you got the tension between the low unemployment rate and the wage rates. And uh, as our old friend uh, Bob Cinch, the uh, former goalie for the um, surveillance hockey team, uh, points out, there was a big revision down in average hourly earnings on a month-to-month -month basis. It went from 06 to 04 in November. So it did fall again, but it just shows that wage pressures seem to be easing at a time when the unemployment rate is falling, which is kind of not what you'd expect. So this raises the debate, and you guys out there on the trading desk can answer it, uh, 25 or 50 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, that's dependent on CPI next week, I guess, yeah. Bramo. Well, we just heard from Randy Krosner that this labor market report increased the chance that the Fed would go 25 basis points at a number of consecutive meetings, moving away from 50 basis point rate hikes. I thought that was fascinating because in the balance of risks, they want to buy insurance, in his words, against going too far if there is this immaculate disinflation. The curve steepening just a little bit. The 10-year now up by three basis points. The two-year not doing much. Equity futures on the S&P 500 are by four tenths of one percent. One of those payrolls reports where I think a lot of people are still working out what to do with this. Coming up in the next hour, Rick Reader of BlackRock, Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, Mike Collins of PGM, then plus Labor Secretary Marty Walsh at 9.45 Eastern Time. I want time. to really hear from Michael Collins there. That's the guy I want to hear from today. I Mike, think that's great that you've got I want to hear from all of them. I think it's a great <laughs> Thanks for that, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really Do you want to give Secretary it. Walsh some love as well? <laughs> it's going to be fascinating to, to, to hear the Jeff administration's Rosenberg response. Now, but the Bond guys, their head's got to be spinning. Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. I'm going to run before you offend anyone else. Okay. Would you like I some shoes? Offend, you know. I recommend sprinting that way. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's just a it's conundrum. Did you say the word Michael conundrum? I think that's where we are. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different conundrum, though. This isn't Greenspan's conundrum. This oh. is, well, it's Jay's conundrum. Uh, futures up 15. The VIX comes in ever so slightly off yesterday's trauma, 22.11. Right now, Jeff Rosenberg joins us, portfolio manager of the Conundrum Fund at BlackRock. We're thrilled he could join us uh, this morning. Jeff, I want to ask you the question I was going to ask Professor Krosner, but instead I'll go to Professor Jeff Rosenberg, and that is, can you substitute a duration or a stasis in Fed policy for going up to a higher rate. Can you actually get away with that shell game? Uh, you know, it, it, it depends on what we're looking at today in, in the data and what it implies about inflation. Today's about, you know, wage inflation. And, you know, can the Fed get away with a pause is, is really about whether they're making good on the inflation uh, uh, trajectory as the market is expecting it to decline. So they'll pause if inflation is declining, but they won't be able to if they're not uh, achieving their inflation uh, objectives. Uh, the, you know, I just want to comment a, a second on the, the report is mixed uh, between the unemployment rate and, 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 the, and, the, and the wages. Uh, as we have seen for a number of reports, the payroll report has really become kind of the, the stepchild of, of economic reports relative to next week's CPI. So what's really important here is what can we look through into this report as to what it says about inflation? And obviously the headline on that is average hourly earnings and that's a little bit positive. But what I want to highlight out of this report is something we haven't talked about yet. You know, the big expectations in inflation is that you have this persistent expectation that goods deflation is going to support the consensus expectation for declining inflation. The one thing out of today's payroll report I think that's interesting to highlight is that if you look at the goods components, wholesale trade, retail, transportation, those are up total uh, 26K in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, the monthly payroll gains, that's a significant change relative to the pace of about a three-month average of negative four, six-month average of around six. And if you look through and you squint a little bit, it is worth noting that this is a little bit of a different story, that we've had an expectation that the good side is deflating. If you look into today's payroll report, it tells you a little bit of a different story, that, that maybe you're seeing some signs of life in the goods. If we see that into next week's pay, uh, CPI report, that's going to be a, a big change relative to market expectations. I think that's one of the interesting takeaways from today's payroll report. People don't do nuance well, Jeff, especially after living under the Fed's thumb for so long in terms of don't fight the Fed. So there is a question of, as you parse through the nuances of this data, what do you do? How does it shift what you actually do in the markets, what you buy, what your thesis is for 2023? Yeah, well, the, this is the thesis for the market consensus thesis is that goods deflation is supporting the peak inflation expectations. That supports the <coughs> Fed pause and, and really feeds into the, the market, the bond market expectation that the Fed can, can pivot. So you have the tension is really on the services inflation. Today on the headline, you get a little bit of support for that because you see average hourly earnings coming down. But this is still a strong labor uh, report. It's still a strong labor 
labor market. And we are not yet seeing a significant tightening in labor markets from the significant tightening in interest rates. That may be lags, but it may also point to a lack of interest rate sensitivity in the broader economy yeah. outside obvious candidates like real estate. I'm looking right now at the market reaction. And as uh, market participants parse through this, you could see yields significantly lower on the front end. This, to me, is interesting, down to 4.4%. It's something to write home uh, about, considering some of the volatility we've seen. But would you lean against this, Jeff? Would you actually say that this labor market report is nothing particularly uh, shocking in order to go against what people think in terms of a hawkish Fed, and that they're going to hold rates at 5% for much longer than currently priced into markets? I think you can't read too much into today's report. As, as I said, it, it's it's mixed. It's got a little bit of everything or a little bit of something for every uh, point of view. Uh, and then I think if, if you stare really closely at some of the data, there is a suggestion here that this consensus view on the good side, you know, may be undermined a little bit. I wouldn't read too much into that. And I think the kind of mixed message is reflective in a relatively muted bond market reaction to the report so far. If you're joining us on radio and television, Jeffrey Rosenberg with us with BlackRock. We continue here with a nice lift of the markets. Futures up 29. Dow futures up uh, 247. The VIX comes in nicely, so it is a better equity market off the uh, report. Uh, a bit of disinversion in the 210 spread. We are on negative 76 basis points. A less inversion here uh, seen uh, by the report. Michael McKee calls it a conundrum. Jeff Rosenberg, how do you allocate here? The hallmark of what we've seen the last two days in surveillance and conversation is everyone extending out their view. It doesn't matter which shop, sell side by side, everybody is reaching out. How do you allocate a portfolio given all this uncertainty right now where the safety may be just to take a stasis bet, not a dynamic bet out into 2023? Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of false changing in, in positions that associated with, you know, year ahead outlooks and the turn in the calendar. We, we haven't really changed much in terms of the narrative from where we left off at the end of last year. This is a, a, a market that is is a split between kind of soft landing and hard landing scenarios. Uh, but where the consensus expectation around declining inflation, you know, leads the ability for the Fed to pivot. And what's interesting and what we saw, you know, in the minutes earlier this week is the tension that that creates with this financial conditions component of monetary yeah. policy transmission. That is, you know, the Fed wanting to push back on markets getting too far ahead of, of a Fed pivot. And I think that means for portfolio positioning, you've got to take what the market gives you. Uh, and I think you've got to be pretty cautious going into that uncertainty. What the market's giving you right now in the fixed income market is an inverted yield curve. Your best yields are found with the least amount of risk. And I think that's what you've got to take here right. until some of the clarity around hard soft landing consensus views around inflation uh, being realized uh, start to get validated in the data. Jeffrey Rosenberg, thank you so much. With BlackRock this morning, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, I'm watching my number one statistic, a negative 0 0.20 standard deviations. If that's Greek to you, all you need to know is it's going away from where Chairman Powell wants to be to an accommodative state. We accommodate now with Ira Jersey, Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, what does this report validate. I'm going to call this a good report. McKee may say I'm wrong, but what does this good report do to validate your outlook for 2023? Yeah, well, I, I do think that it's showing that we're seeing a, a, at least a little bit of moderation in that labor income growth. And and what what when I look at aggregate labor income, um, I look at the total number of jobs uh, times the weekly earnings. And weekly earnings that's fallen quite significantly. So that was over seven percent last month. It's now uh, just a little over six percent now on a year-on-year -year basis. And as long as that keeps coming down, that means that the Fed is probably nearing the end of its interest rate hike. So um, so, so we put out in, in our monthly just a couple of days ago that we thought that um, the Fed was only going to go 25 basis points this month because, in my view, they're in calibration mode. And that means that we've probably seen the peak in most yields um, uh, uh, for this cycle so far. So, uh, so, so again, a continuation of this trend. And I, I think that the Fed's going to be pretty happy, actually. Ira, this is really interesting to me. In other words, you think that we've seen peak yields across the curve, even on the front end, despite the fact that increasing number of people are saying that perhaps the Fed's going to have to shock this market into cooperating with a tightness that it's <laughs> desiring. 
Well, so it, it really depends. When you look at the very front end, when I say peak yields, I really am talking about twos and further out the curve. Um, but, you know, the, even if the Fed goes to, say, 5.5%, um, then fair value uh, for, for two-year yields is actually only about 4.6%. Uh, so it's not that, that crazy, particularly since the higher the Fed goes, the more likely the market's going to price for just deeper cuts uh, in the, the either very late this year and certainly into 2024. So, so as we as we get the, the Fed pushing against the slowing economy, um, we're, we're going to just see a deeper uh, expectations for deeper cuts, and that's going to keep most of the yield curve, uh, you know, if not as inverted as it was, certainly uh, certainly at yields that are at these levels or maybe even a lot lower. I just am struggling with this idea that we got an above expectation on the headline number. There are signs of reinflation in certain goods sectors. There are signs that there still is resilience, that that would be enough, Ira, for this Federal Reserve to back away and allow things to rip. Do you think that that is plausible, despite the rhetoric? Well, I, I don't think things are going to rip at this point because the, the Fed has hiked quite a lot, right? Like as someone said yesterday when they looked at SOFR futures and were like, oh my God, those rates are so high. Now they're only so high vis-a-vis -vis the last decade. They're not high, you know, given given the, you know, <laughs> our careers and, and how high interest rates were prior to the financial crisis. Um, but but the Fed, I think, is in calibration mode. So even if they only hike 25 basis points in January, that doesn't mean that they're, they can't go to 6%. It just might take them another, uh, another you know, six weeks or, or, or three months in order mm -hmm. to get there. So um, so, so really, they're trying to calibrate because, you know, Jay Powell has mentioned and a lot of members have mentioned they don't want to hike too much. But the problem is, is that they don't know where the final number should really be in order for an equilibrium in the economy. And, and you know, Tom, yeah. as you pointed out, financial conditions, if you go to FCON uh, Go on your, your Bloomberg terminal, you'll see that financial conditions are have eased, but they're also have, have eased from the last couple of months. But they're still much, much tighter than they were, say, at the beginning of 2021. All right, Jersey, we look forward. Bloomberg Intelligence Fixed Income Publishing after the jobs report. That'll be out on the Bloomberg terminal here uh, in a bit. He sits here, Lisa. You bring him in because I'm in the glow Thanks. of I watching McKee do the <laughs> McKee magic. Well, this is actually the most interesting secrets. part. He has secret spreadsheets. Even Marty Walsh doesn't have the spreadsheets <laughs> that Mike McKee They glow. Has. They bring you in. They have pictures. This is, I'm it's just, sensual. before we get to Mike, I do want to just give you a sense that the NASDAQ right now is at more than 1% in uh, in pre-market trading. You could see yields uh, substantially Vicks lower, notably in. lower. This is a market that is embracing the idea Oil heard from Randy Krosner, which is the immaculate disinflation. Like Are we that. seeing like, that? Like and it. this idea that yeah. the Fed could downshift to 25 basis points yeah. at its next meeting. Mike, you've been looking through all of the details of the report. What is the divergence between services, to, between uh, manufacturing? What is the underlying belly of this report sell you? Well, give me two seconds here. I was just plugging in the numbers for the uh, for the uh, and wage changes. And uh, services wages actually came in lower than the increase in goods producing wages. There you go. Goods producing Producing were up four tenths last month, and it was only a three tenths gain for services producing. So maybe what we're seeing is uh, a kind of return to, uh, as Tom said much earlier, uh, pre pandemic well, trends. Is there anything seasonally that could have uh, something to do with this in terms of people not getting as many new jobs in this latest report or changing or anything like that? Or is this just really a clean read? Well, we know the seasonals have been kind of screwed up by the pandemic and hiring has changed a lot. Uh, we did see uh, retail jobs added this month, but they were subtracted in November. And that's not uh, usually what happens. So, yeah, there could be some aspects to that. Uh, I noticed that uh, the, there's no real category that just jumps out at you with a lot of jobs. Uh, leisure and hospitality, 67,000. Yeah, we've been anticipating that. Manufacturing, 28,000. Construction, still 8,000. So even though housing is rolling over, now the, the mortgage brokers uh, lost seven and a half thousand and then here's my interesting stat of the day for you federal government employment rose by only one thousand and we know there are 434 people 
in Washington who at this point are not getting a paycheck. Are they in the statistics? They haven't, they, they, they haven't been sworn in yet. McKee looking for the McCarthy angle. Michael McKee, thank you. And he'll dive into this. You'll hear from Michael McKee on radio and television here through the morning on this important jobs report. We look at the ultimate conundrum, which is picking up the pieces of an equity market to forget in 2022, making her first appearance on Bloomberg Surveillance or people have allowed her to come on before earnings season. Gina Martin-Adams joins us, chief equity strategist for Bloomberg uh, Intelligence. Uh, Gina, I don't want to go economics on you right now. I want to go on what your team is thinking about into earnings season. What is their number one mystery? You know, I think the number one mystery is where is the margin growth going to come from later into 2023? Uh, when we look at the consensus expectation, consensus has gone a long way to pricing and earnings recession. Uh, certainly, earnings have been falling X energy all year in 2022. Earnings are now expected by the consensus to fall for three consecutive quarters uh, overall for the S&P 500. So the consensus is getting significantly more bearish, consistent right. with the economic trends. But where they're getting a little bit more optimistic is in the idea that we are in the midst of forming our margin low on the index. If that is indeed the case, we're likely to see earnings improve materially into 2024. And it's a bit of a conundrum as to where that's going to come from. The consensus right now thinks a lot of that comes from tech, suddenly showing some degree of improvement in the revenue lines as of the first quarter. Where is that earnings growth going to come from in an environment where business investment is contracting now? Uh, so I think we've got, you know, companies are going to have a lot of questions to answer in the upcoming weeks. Gina, there's also a question about what the impact of a slower pace of rate hikes will have on specific industries that have thought to be very interest rate sensitive. I'm thinking of big tech. You're seeing NASDAQ get a pop today. How long does this story make sense to you, where if the Fed doesn't become as restrictive as some people think, that it will become a wholehearted positive for the tech sector? Yeah, I think there's a lot of conflicting sort of wins with respect to tech, Lisa. So first, our view would be that tech hasn't even priced in the rate hikes that we've had, let alone the rate hikes yet to come. When we look at high duration or long duration stocks relative to short duration, low duration stocks, we see still a tremendous gap there where tech is a high duration sector, the, mo the highest duration sector indeed in the S&P 500, still <clears throat> trading at a standard deviation above its long-term average premium to the S&P. That it really flies in the face of what we're seeing with rates currently. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is that tech is the earnings laggard in the S&P 500 and is experiencing the, neg the most negative pace of earnings estimate revision right now. So until those two things sort of square off right. in a much better condition, I think it's going to be really difficult for tech to perform well, even if the Fed pauses. If tech is still the earnings right. laggard, there's not a big case to get excited about tech. Gina, you got 45 seconds. You have a wonderful portfolio launched two months ago with Bloomberg Intelligence. How much did it tank in the last 60 days of the year, and how are you going to pick up the pieces on your portfolio in 2023? You know, the MVP portfolio is actually uh, has done relatively well because it is a value oriented portfolio with a focus on pop profitability as well as momentum. It has very little energy exposure at the moment. Energy has been a really tough place to be over the last couple of months, and it has very little tech exposure as well. So it's sort of, you know, it's been invested in an area of the market that gets a little bit less attention, frankly, mm -hmm. but also is less volatile, more profitable, and uh, has significant value. It's generally designed to be a longer-term portfolio, so, you know, a two-month time horizon is a little bit rough for a benchmark, but nonetheless, it's done quite oh, well. Oh, come on, that's long-term in your world. Gina Martin-Adams, thank you uh, so much with Bloomberg Intelligence. I'm, I'm going to tout this all year, folks. You're going to hate me for it. They've got a really smart, whether you agree with it or not, doesn't matter. It's great to study the Bloomberg Intelligence MVP portfolio just as a study on value at this time. Lisa, I was making a joke about this earlier. I don't think we 
got the banner up on this being the Elizabeth Warren jobs report. I'm sorry, it's a pretty good report. How does Chairman Powell react to the Senator Warren jobs report? It's going to be interesting because they don't want to signal the all clear sign for fear or of uh, getting ahead of themselves, <clears throat> of allowing markets to get ahead of what they want the policy to be. They're looking at an unemployment rate that rivals the lows that we have seen going back to the late 1960s. They are talking about the idea that even amid this strength, we're seeing that disinflation, the fact that wages are not increasing as quickly as possible. How many more of these do we need to see before people can start getting more optimistic well, about some sort <clears throat> of uh, more healthy and normal labor market? I will say Alan Greenspan codified the word conundrum that Mr. McKee used today, and that's where we are. Conundrum is green on the screen, up a solid 1.1 percent. Standard & Poor's futures up 45, Dow up 367 points. The VIX 21.78 comes in smartly, a better statistic, less fear on the VIX. Please stay with us through the day. Really going to be interesting. On radio, on television, this is Bloomberg Surveillance.